is uh, Dr. Gary Secor, he co author with Liliana Rivera and Melvin Bolton. And he's going to be talking to us about sensitivity of the Cotsworth and Piccolo to foliar fungicides and plant plain too. Good. So, anyway, I, I, I do want to talk again, as I talk every year, about sensitivity to fungicides. And this is for obviously for 22 because we just finished the testing. Most of the accolades go for Viviana Rivera, who does all the work, and I get the credit for delivering the presentation. So, anyway, thank you for that. The first one I want to talk about is tin. Uh, tin resistance, incidence and severity of tin resistance in our population, in our isolates, collected from beet fields in North Dakota, Minnesota. Okay. In 2022, we collected 648 samples, and that's about half the number that we've, we've uh, had collected previously because the other half were tested at the beginning of the season. So we wanted to collect a number of 600 samples at the beginning of the season and then 600 at the end of the season. So I think Nate's going to do some talking about some of the detection of the early thing. Earlier, the, the, the uh, agronomist brought the samples to us. We, we lyophilized the samples and, and Nate did the PCR assay. So we're starting to get a good joint project, expanding our efforts and expanding our horizons a little bit. So we tested. So the data I'm showing is these 648 samples. So this is from the left-hand side from 1998 through, through 2022. Okay, The blue bars are the field incidents. So this is the percentage of fields with tin resistance, okay? So that ranges, it started out in 1998, 64% of the fields had resistance. Look at 2021 and 2022, almost 100% of the fields have tin resistance. So that tin incidence, you can see it popped up here, it went down here for some reason, I have no idea why. And then I think we started using tin again because we were worried about the DMIs. And so look at the incidence of tin. So tin is really a lot of resistance in tin. This red line is the percent spore germination. So we look at 100 spores for germination or not. If they germinate, they're resistant, of course, because they can grow. So you can see that the incidence of spore germination, the, that's also increasing, not, over the number of, not only the number of fields, but the amount of spores that germinate. So it stabilized between 2021 and 22 at about, what's that, 65%. So a lot of spores are resistant. Most fields have got resistance. So we got a pretty big issue with tin. The good news about tin is there's a fitness penalty. So when you quit using tin, the sensitive ones outcompete the resistant ones. So we can get sensitivity back again by quitting using tin. But then we got the risk, we're not gonna get as good a control. So maybe we can do something with the CR plus varieties to get rid of a tin application or something, okay? So anyway, that's tin, okay? This is the incidence of fields with, with isolates resistant to tin. Is that me? No, back there. So that's resistant to tin from 2019 to 22 by factory district. So you can see that the tin resistance, blue is 22, you can see the tin resistance has increased in every single factory district. So you're not alone in any of your factory districts. So you can choose your factory district, and you can see that there's a high incidence of tin across the whole growing area. So this is an industry-wide problem. Okay, so we'll switch now to resistance factor. We'll switch to the, to the DMI fungicides, the triazole DMI fungicides, okay? We have four of them. Eminent, Inspire, Proline, and Provisol. So we get a lot of those good ones there, okay? So this is the resistance factor from 2018 in the left-hand column to 2020 in the right-hand column for each of these four fungicides. And you can see that for Inspire, it's gradually or pretty dramatically increased uh, from 2018 to 2022. Proline did not really increase a lot but we're not sure we're using the right product to do the testing there because it changes from prothio to destio and destio has got all the activity and we're trying to figure that out collectively. Uh, eminent, uh, you can see that eminent is not really increasing. And that's kind of a surprise to us that it's sort of stabilized and leveled off during these years from 
what's that, 19, 20, 21, and 22. That's kind of a surprise. At, look at our friend Probosol. That's been rapidly increasing as well. That's only just been a product that we've been using just recently, and it's quickly become uh, developed a lot of resistance. So this is kind of their resistance profiles from 18 to 22. And this is the this is the distribution of sensitivity to these same four DMI fungicides as measured by EC50 is what we measure in the laboratory in 2022. And these colors showed up way better on my laptop than they show up here. So, <laughs> oh, here they are. Oh, yeah. This is what they're supposed to be. Thank you. Yeah. So the these colors look on the side screens, but you can see eminent here. Okay. Red is, well, the red color is greater than 100. Uh, EC50 value is 100. The, uh, what's that, orange color is 10 to 100. The yellow color, <laughs> yellow color is 1 to 10. And then the other colors are, sensitive okay so you can see the amount of red the amount of uh, red increases the amount of resistance increases with the different fungicides eminence very low inspire is, is a little higher proline's a little higher and provosol is even higher but the, these middle values of 10 to 100 is where most of, most of the activity is okay you can see that color better but I want to look now at each of these, each of the, the DMI fungicides individually, okay? And this is by factory district, okay? So you can choose your factory district here and you can see, okay? The interesting thing, this is eminent. This is eminent across factory districts, okay? But look at, there are no highly resistant varieties to eminent anymore. Those are all zeros at that high level. And they used to be, higher than that. So eminent is decreasing in resistance, okay? And that's probably because we're not using it as much because it's kind of got out of disfavor to some of the other fungicides. So maybe there is a fitness penalty in there that we don't know about. So eminent looks like it's doing pretty well, okay? No, no highly resistant. Again, the reds are greater than 100. Okay? So most of them are in the 10 to 100 now. Very few are in the fully sensitive at the very bottom of those, uh, those bars. So that's kind of a surprise to us. Here is the same kind of data for Inspire. And you can see we got a little bit more resistance from over 100 parts per million. Okay, So a little higher resistance here. Again, the 10 to 100 is still present. The 1 to 10 is still there. And the lower levels, there's pretty low levels. Okay. And if we look at Proline, remember this is by factory district. Okay, so you can find your favorite factory district there. And you can see we got a little bit more red here with Proline, a little more resistance going in with Proline. Even though if you talk to the industry people, Proline seems to be doing really well in the field. Right? And if you look at Provosol, again, you can see way more resistance across all factory districts to, uh, to Cercospro. So we've got, a, we've got a little bit of difference here. So if you look at Eminent, it hardly has any high resistance all the way to Provosol with lots of resistance. So there is a difference among the triazole DMI fungicides. They're not all created equal, okay? And I think Melvin's gonna talk about this sometime, not this time, sometime. but sometime you're gonna talk about this. So they've got a big project trying to elucidate why those differences exist. And this sees the same thing in testing and doing the EC50 values. So it looks like we can maybe make a little headway among some of these DMI fungicides. They're not all the same. And they use different ones in Europe than we use here. Hmm? Okay. So here's our friend Headline. Okay. Remember Headline used to work really well in, what's that, 2012? We barely had any resistance in 2012. Well, of course, it worked so well, we kept using it and using it and using it and using it, and more resistance develops. So anything that's red is basically 100% resistance. And you've seen this trend over the years because I, kept, I think I've talked every one of these years. So you can see that it continues to be highly resistant at the expense of sensitive isolates. So again, headline continues to be resistant. We don't have, there's no point in using it because almost everything is highly resistant, okay. don't have any sensitivity. And if you look at factory district, this is headline, 
from 2022 across all the factory districts, pretty much all red. Hmm. So you got resistance across all the factory districts. It's not just those that continue to use headline. It's just there. Okay. So that's all I'm going to, the only slides I'm going to show. So maybe some summary and conclusions that I'd kind of like to just share with you all. Pin, still are our best weapon. We're the only ones in the world that has this. U.S. is the only one where it's labeled. The number of fields with tin resistance declined 36 and 65% the past two years, but increased 69% to almost 100% in 2021 and 22. So tin resistance is increasing. The incidence of, of resistance spores was 20% in 18, 30% in 19, 40% in 20, stabilized to 65% in 21 and 22. So the number of resistant spores also increased. We need to preserve this fungicide because resistance is easy to get and it's easy to get rid of when you quit using it. So we need to make some mechanisms to try to serve, uh, save tin, I think. Topsin, we don't test for topsin and we didn't test for topsin this year. It's still registered, it's still viable, but resistance is out there in more than 70% of the fields. Resistance to topsin doesn't go away. So. It still can be a player, but it's not really an important player. Okay, The triazoles, this is where the action is. We have these four DMI fungicides. The resistance factor decreased slightly for eminent and has been rel relatively stable the past four years. So eminent, even though it's quit being used, it still looks like it's working pretty well. Resistance is increasing for Inspire, Provosol, and Proline, but less for Proline than the other two. And we've got some evidence that, that some of the fungicides work the same and others work a little bit differently. And you can alternate those two different ones. So you can maybe manage that resistance a little bit. We hope there's a fitness penalty and for those with high RF values, because the higher, the, the more resistant they get, the more they might have to give up some other factor and become, uh, have some uh, uh, fitness penalty because they're so highly resistant. Uh, we are evaluating some mutations in Bolton's lab to try to get a to try to get a PCR test. And Nate, well, actually, they're both doing it. Nate and Melvin to try to do get some PCR testing, so it's easier to monitor these, so it doesn't take as long. And um, I think we need to continue to use Mancozeb or a copper partner every time we put on a fungicide. The copper inhibit spore germination at 10 parts per million. No resistance has ever been reported to Mancozeb since its registration in 1948. So we don't ever have to worry about resistance to Mancozeb. That's a pretty solid fungicide, okay? QOIs, single gene mutation, resistance since uh, 2016, greater than 90%. Doesn't appear to be a fitness penalty uh, for those that are resistant to headline. And QOI is still not recommended for CLS management because it doesn't work. If they're all resistant, still can be used for frost, or it still is used for frost protection. Okay. Um, I think we, we need to develop better CLS resistant varieties. Well, we've done that. We got CR plus now. So now we need to figure out how does that fit in with fungicide resistance? How does CR plus fit in with that fungicide resistance? Okay. Do the new varieties with high resistance? affect fungicide sensitivity or fungicide resistance? We don't know the answer to that. I may not be around long enough to answer that question, but I think it's something that needs to be answered. Um, we've done some work on adjusting the forecasting to include spore production and germination for earlier fungicide application, okay? Because we think that, that's an improvement over the existing model of when you put that first spray on. And Viviana is going to give a presentation, I think three after this, is gonna talk about some of the work we've done with early forecasting or early spore detection. And Nate's gonna talk about some early testing to detect latent infection of beets in the field before you can ever see the spots. So I think there's some early application of fungicides that are gonna be talked about later and are gonna be important. Um, the other thing is, is Viviana noticed that when she's looking at all these samples, we saw a lot more alternaria this year than we've seen in past years, okay? 
is that because this was such a wet year? Did that favor alternaria? Or are we are we getting more alternaria because the fungicides you're using are also making alternaria resistant? Or do we just simply have more alternaria for variety susceptibility? I think that's something that we may want to do some thinking about. Uh, we don't really know what species of alternaria we have out there, and there's a number of long uh, long spored and short spored uh, alternarias. We need to find out which one they are. Uh, we've done some work with Mark Anfenrud, who brings us samples on a regular basis, whether we want them or not, right? <laughs> Mark, you know, I'm saying that jokingly. So we've been able to get a lot of alternaria samples that we need to look at uh, because alternaria might be a, a bigger player than we think. Nashok and I talked a little bit about that this morning too. So that'll continue to have, get you more awards in the future. Yeah, you do that. Job security. Yeah. Job security, exactly right. So anyway, is it opportunistic or is it really an important player in the, in the sugar beet industry? So I need to acknowledge all the support that you all gave us and the companies that provided the technical grade product that we use and technical assistance of Judith Rangifo, who is just phenomenal in, in her, she's really, uh, she's really um, strict and she, <laughs> she really goes right after it. So she's really good at that. I also have to give acknowledgements, which I forgot to put up here of our USDA colleagues who we continually interact with and have lots of uh, good conversations over beer or over lunch. And which do you think are the most productive? <laughs> beer and napkins, right? They're the best. So hey, our next uh, presentation will be is entitled Crop Sequence and Tillage Effects on Crop Pests, Soil Microbes and Soil Properties, being pre presented by Myola Adirju, co-authored with Sunil Bandari, Guy Pinyan, S. Banerjee, and Mohammed Khan. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Maiwa Adewuju. I'm a graduate student of Plant Pathology Department, North Dakota State University. Um, earlier this morning, a lot of my colleagues have talked about um, the importance of crop sequence and tillage type on um, crop production and pest management. So I'll be giving a similar uh, um, presentation. Um, this time I'll be talking about the impact of crop sequence and tillage type on crop yield and quality, soil properties and microbial population. Okay. So um, the outlines for this presentation includes introduction, um, the objectives of this um, project. I would also be talking about the results from our first year in 2021. I'll be talking about the work done so far in 2022, and I'll be talking about the future work to be done as regards this project, and I'll be making, making my summary and conclusion. So it is very important to note that um, there is a need for um, a sustainable management option for crop production and also an eco-friendly approach to weed control, disease management, and, best manage and pest management. So most importantly, um, to having the right rotation crop and the best tillage practice could help us control disease, infection, and pest infestation, and also um, conserve and improve soil fertility. So these all rationale laid the foundation for the objectives of this project, which is to determine the impact of tillage and crop sequence on yield quality of major crops grown in rotation, the microbial population of the soil over time, and we would also look at the disease severity caused by a number of plant pathogenic organisms in sugar beet and other um, crops. So this will help us um, account and document the best practices for managing insecticides, um, herbicide and fungicide resistance of the crop in this sequence. So I need to note that um, the crops we are looking at for this project in sequence are um, we have sugar beet, which is more of the focus crop, and soybean, corn, and um, wheat. So um, in the first year, which is 2021, we looked at two factors, the impact of two factors, which is tillage type and crop sequence. And so for the tillage type, we had the conventional um, tillage type, 
the strip till and no till. And we add this, we did this sequence for the first year. So <clears throat> in the first year, we uh, analyzed the results we got after harvesting, and we looked at the impact of tillage type on a number of parameters. And um, so um, for the purpose of this presentation, I would be highlighting the the parameters that showed significant results because I wouldn't want to waste your time with um, results uh, with results that are not really significant to um, what we are here to do today. So <clears throat> um, we observed that for the yield, um, I need to note that this yield is for the corn because for the first year we had corn in rotation with soybean. So for the first year we observed that conventional tillage had um, a yield of about 214 bushel per acre, which was significantly higher when we compared it to the other tillage types. So uh, we also look, looked at the moisture content and we also observed that the conventional tillage also had the highest moisture contents, which is quite similar to the strip tillage, but significantly higher, to, uh, higher than the um, no-till um, type. We also looked at the impact of tillage type on organic matter. And we observed that the conventional tillage uh, had about 4.89 um, organic matter content, significantly higher than the others. But when we at uh, the depth of zero to six inches, but um, when we went deeper into the soil, sorry, we observed that the conventional tillage we think the highest uh, organic matter contents, but when we compare the um, numbers from at the depth of zero to six inches to the one we have here at six to 24 inches, we observe that the organic matter content reduced from 4.89 to 3.4.59, sorry, to 3.89 here. Yeah? And um, that's kind of answers the question um, that was posed earlier about, about um, the impact or does tillage type influence um, the organic matter or microbial activity in the soil. So I think we do have um, a guess because the project is still ongoing. So we also looked at the average log abundance of 16 SD from the soil samples, which um, accounts for the um, the abundance of microbes in the soil, bacteria and fungi, but this um, data, I'm sorry, it's not clear. Um, this data shows that of bacteria and we observe that the conventional tillage, this, this box plot is for corn, why this is for soybean. And um, we observe that the conventional tillage had a higher log abundance, but which is quite similar to strip till, but when we compared it with the no till, we observed that it was actually significantly higher, but we did not observe any um, significant difference for the soybean box plot. Also, we looked at the impact of the second um, factor we, um, we were considering, which is the crop sequence on the same parameters um, like we did for the tillage type. And we observed that we did not really see um, that much sig significant impact of crop sequence on the parameters, but we did see for sorbita and organic matter. Um, sorbita being a parameter, a parameter that accounts for the rate of respiration and CO2 activity of soil uh, of microbes in soil. We saw that um, the crop sequence to which is actually soybean add a more um, at a higher percentage of solvita um, as compared to the um, crop sequence three and four. And um, for the organic matter content, we observed that um, there was no significant difference at the depth of zero to six inches, but here we have a significant difference for the crop sequence. Um, I need to remind you that the crop sequence four is corn, and corn showed a, a higher significant organic matter content compared to the other crop sequence. Um, so we did the um, 
we continued the, uh, the project for the second year, which was 2022. And um, we maintained the tillage type, but this time we added different crop sequence um, as shown here. So this shows the narrative of the whole project for 20, 2022. And um, um, the crops we add in rotation are corn, wheat, soybean, soybean and sugar beet. Um, the picture up here shows the conventional tillage and this shows the street tillage. And the blue arrow is pointing towards the um, soybean plots while the red arrow towards the sugar beet plots. So we, after harvesting this, this year, um, last year, 2022, um, we looked at the yield for across the tillage types and we observed that um, irrespective of the, the um, erosion and late planting last year, we observed that strip tillage had a higher recoverable sucrose of 3,041 per hectare, which is significantly higher when we compared it to conventional tillage and no-till. And um, that also gives an idea about what um, a presenter uh, what, what um, I think Aaron showed about strip tillage um, for uh, as a potential option for controlling um, erosion in uh, in sugar beets. So when we also compared the yield for, um, for soybean, though the conventional tillage at numerically at the highest um, bushel per hectare of twenty seven, but when we did the statistical analysis across tillage type, we observed that. There was no significant difference uh, as regards the uh, yield of soybean. Um, we also did some um, analysis of some laboratory work to account for nematode population in the soil for each um, plot, and we did the soil sampling earlier. Um, at the, if I remember correctly, at the middle of September, so after harvesting, so. We homogenize the soil samples, we extract the cyst nematode in the soil, and we did the cyst count under the dissecting microscope. And this um, year shows the cyst nematode. You, I, you can see the arrow pointed to this circular um, cyst like um, object here. And um, that's the cyst nematode under the microscope. And the preliminary results showed that we add more cyst nematode in the sugar beets compared to the soybean. And um, this, this is one of the focus of this presentation because we are starting to um, get concerned about the, the possible increase of um, sugar beets. It's a guess, right? But uh, we need to look at the, the increasing um, population of um, sugar beet cyst nematode, the guess, um, in sugar beet plots. So, um, we actually compared, um, we looked at the impact of the two factors, um, which is um, tillage type and um, tillage type and crop sequence on nematode population. And we observed that there was no significant difference. Um, there was no significant difference when we looked at the impact of crop sequence on nematode population. But here, we do observe that um, tillage really played a, a, a significant role in impacting the nematode population as we observe a sig significantly higher nematode population in the no-till. So um, for the future work, what we do know is that we do have um, cis nematode in the soil, but we have our guess around, um, we do not know what cis nematode we have in the soil. Though we have our guess around, um, it could potentially be um, the potato cyst nematode, soybean cyst nematode, etheroidea shakti, um, etheroidea glycine, or the sugar beet um, cyst nematode, which could actually be a problem. So we hope to we would conduct a DNA extraction and PCR to identify um, which nematode we have in the soil. Uh, we would also conduct pathogenicity tests in, um, in the greenhouse to provide information about uh, the virulence of 
this is nemato to sugar beet or soybean and um currently we are we would we are conducting uh microbial extraction and identification and we would also look to quantify the impact of tillage type and crop sequence on earthworm and insect population in summary um the, pro the pro research so far shows that the conventional tillage shows more promising potential in increasing the productivity and soil health uh, amongst all other tillage types. Also, uh, the nematode population was greatly impacted by tillage type and could significantly increase in a field where there is no tillage. We also observed that um, the strip tillage shows a better potential for erosion control in sugar beets with a significant recoverable sucrose of 3,041 per acre. Um, conclu conclusively, the overall result shows that the tillage type uh, had more sig significant influence on yield of which have we've, as we've seen so far, and in moisture contents, organic matter, sorbita, and nematode population compared to the second factor, which is crop sequence. Thank you for listening. Okay, um, our next presentation is entitled Survey Identification and Characterization of Storage Pathogens of Sugar Beet in the Red River Valley of North Dakota and Minnesota. It's being presented by Mohammed Zia Buyan, uh, uh, Peter Hawk, uh, co-author and Mohammed Khan, co-author. Good afternoon, everyone. Today yeah, I'll be uh, presenting uh, the research report on survey identification, characterization of storage pathogens, the sample collected from different locations of Red River Valley of North Dakota and Minnesota. So as we know, sugar beet is a big industry and North Dakota and Minnesota combinedly contributed 57% of total sugar beet production, which is approximately $5 billion economy. But sugar beet, after harvest, sugar beet, uh, actually the end product sugar quality did deteriorates. It's believed that association of microbial uh, pathogens, respirations, own injury, even the environment, uh, storage, storage environment significantly reduced the quality of sugar. So it, it was uh, experimented earlier that around 0.14% per day sugar content losses due to storage condition. Even if it is poor, it's reported approximately 60% reduction of sugar content. So for this study, we collected sample from three different locations of uh, sugar factory of Minnesota and four uh, North Dakota uh, locations. East Grand Forks, Crookstone, Moorhead from Minnesota, Ardock, Reynolds, St. Thomas, and Wapiton, Mindak. Uh, so for this study, we did morphological uh, characterization and identifications. We did microscopic observations. So we grow uh, the pathogens in malt extract agromedia and clarified via juice media. So we studied the colony morphology and growth pattern. And as well as on microscopic observation, we studied the color uh, uh, conidia, conidiophore, and the mycelia. So for molecular identification, we uh, considered five different primers. ITS, second largest ribosomal protein subunit, RPB2 primer, translation elongation factor, beta tubulin for short uh, base pair length and calmodulin genes. So briefly, the molecular steps uh, we followed. Initially, we extracted the DNA from the pure isolated pathogens, and then we did conventional PCR followed by Sanger sequences and alignment of the sequences and then we blast in NCBA. So we identified 10 different uh, penicillin species, as I believe most of them are not reported yet in sugar beet for Red River Billy of North Dakota and Minnesota. So especially penicillin expansion, penia, penum, 
polonicum, crustosum, femurum, and celerum. These are very brand new in sugar beet. And for and other pathogen associated for these, uh, the samples we collected. So both trites, clarosporium, several species of mucor and aspergillus. We got some minor species, Foma, Betty, Sordaria, Fusarium, Oxysporum, Rhizopus, Orizi, and Macrofomina, Fasiolina. So, and we also reported four different type trichoderma species. So one of them, oh, sorry. So trichoderma polysperum, as we know, trichoderma hardgenum is in oil known and oil research uh, biocontrol agent. In addition to that, we already uh, conducted in vitro and greenhouse studies. So we found that trichoderma polysporum could be an, an promising biocontrol agent for controlling. Uh, we studied on sclerotinia, sclerosiorum, and rhizoctonia solani. Uh, so we did pathogenicity test. We didn't, uh, I was not able to conduct test all of them. So from them, I tested nine uh, storage pathogens. So we did both surface, surface uh, onding or injury and uh, cork borer agar plug method. We incubated for four weeks at storage temperature, cold storage at NDSU, and then we evaluated the disease severity or disease development. So we calculated the most prevalent species uh, genus from the collected samples of penicillium followed by trichoderma, botrytis, and aspergillus. Fusarium and clerosporiums, they constitute approximately 8% and 7% and other uh, Foma, Sordaria, Rhizopus, they constitute 12%. So among 20, 267 isolates, we found we isolated 175 isol uh, pathogens from North Dakota factory uh, samples and 92 from Minnesota. So from all of the sample percent, state-wise percent distribution, we found around 65% uh, of the isolates are isolated from North Dakota and uh, rest of 35% from Minnesota. Uh, uh, the, this graph indicating a statewide distribution of individual of uh, uh, microbial uh, 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 pathogens, but it's indicated in both cases, uh, penicillium are the most pr predominant uh, prevalent uh, storage pathogens followed by both right is fusarium and other species. So we can uh, summarize and conclude to this presentation that penicillium, both right is and uh, aspergillus are the most prevalent and common species uh, causing storage disease. As I am not yet sure the other pathogens, we need to be tested for pathogenicity and further molecular characterization. North Dakota is surprised the amount of isolated isolated from both the state, North Dakota and Minnesota. And minor pathogens, as we mentioned earlier, Foma, Sordaria, Rhizopus, and Macrofomina. And uh, Trichoderma could be an excellent uh, addition to further biocontrol study, uh, controlling some soil borne and other pathogens. And I would like to give big thanks to my PhD research advisor, Dr. Mohamed Khan, Dr. Karan Fugate, John, Dr. Sham Kandal, for the discussion and valuable suggestion. All my lab, lab mates, Sunil, uh, oh, Peter Haig, who got the samples, and Sunil, Sushmita, Mayua, Emma, and I would like to give big thanks during my PhD journey or research funded by uh, Sugar Beet Research and Education Board and uh, my uh, NDUC department, Plant Pathology, and all faculties and teacher and everyone in Zoom and in person. Uh, thank you very much for patience hearing, and I would be happy to have any questions. Uh, so our next presentation is entitled Early Cercospora Viticola Spore Detection and Germination in Commercial Sugar Beet Fields, presented by Viviana Rivera, co-authored with Gary Secor, Nathan Wyatt, and Melvin Bolton. So um, as we know, uh, management of the uh, Cercospora Viticola, um, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Secospora viticola leaf stop is 
spot continue to be a um, disease in sugar beet that is endemic in, in our region. Management uh, requires in, an integral approach, which consists in resistant varieties, cultural, uh, cultural practices, and timely fungicide application. The fungicide used uh, for the cospora vetticola management are mostly protectant and they work better when they apply before uh, the infection occur. Uh, Non-curative, uh, do not stop the disease uh, once it's, uh, the disease development. Timing of the first application varies greatly. It can be uh, use calendar, appearance of the first spot, before row closure, or using forecast models. In, in this model, we have two models, 10 and 10, developed in the 80s, and a big class model developed in 2004. Both of these uh, models uh, use the weather data to uh, develop the uh, daily infection value. Uh, this uh, weather data are mainly uh, re relative humidity and temperature. This is used, uh, this model is used by the industry and the growers to predict the, uh, the spread of the disease and also the first uh, the applications, the fungicide application. Both models uh, predict conditions favorable for the disease development in the field after the first spore is, is uh, detected. This model, both of these, don't, don't include uh, the condition favorable for the spore production and germination, and this is very important in early infection. Early infection need early fungicide application. So this is uh, the reasoning for uh, doing this research. Uh, a field observation indicated that it's a very disease control uh, with early fungicide application compared to the later fungicide application. Previous work in our lab uh, shows that a uh, Sacospora viticola can grow in lower temperature than a uh, previous uh, uh, reported. The uh, Sacospora can grow and produce a spore in temperature as low as a 50 Fahrenheit or 10 Celsius in a period of time. Free water is uh, more important than high relative humidity for a spore germination. So based on this uh, thinking, we uh, developed this study and the objective was or are, uh, to see uh, how early is, uh, the cercospora spore can be produced and if the spores are present before the crop emerge. And also we want to determine how early the infection can occur. I want to refer the, to the two first uh, points and Dr. Wyatt will call, uh, talk about the third one. <laughs> so for this, we did a study, two years of study in 21 and 22. We used a sport trap that was uh, a weather station that was installed at the age of six field, the commercial uh, sugar field, sugar beet field in three locations in Minnesota. And this uh, sport trap were um, put in the field a, after, right after a uh, planting and before emergence. Uh, we have two field sites for cooperative uh, selected by the agronomists. These fields were adjacent um, uh, to a field that they have a sugar beet the previous season. And in 2021, we have a field in Comstock, Burley and Renville, and 22 in Kindred, Burley and Renville. So uh, once the cartridge were in top, uh, the Sport uh, trap were installed. We collected the cartridge three times a week for 14 weeks in 2021, and uh, three times a week for eight weeks in 2022. The uh, cartridge membrane were tested for the presence of uh, Cercospora reticular DNA by using a PCR. This was a quality uh, test, so we just want to see if there is a cercospora present or not, we didn't quantify the amount of the spore present in the membrane. So this in this picture, we can see the spore trap are located at the edge of the field, and these are the weather station. So a close-up of the spore trap, this is where the wind goes into the that little tunnel, and the cartridge goes in between in this part. So uh, the membrane captured all the 
insect dirt spore that fly into the uh, uh, spore trap. And we take this uh, membrane and we test for the presence of Cercospora reticulum. So uh, the result in 2021, uh, Cercospora spore were detected the first week in May in, three, in all three locations and sporadically after uh, uh, until June, uh, August 2nd. In this year, we in that year we tested 250 cartridge during this period. The spore uh, were detected 45% of the collection day in Comstock and Pearly, and 52.4% of the time in Renby. Uh, of course, you all know that 21 was a dry year and with a very early planting date. In 2022, uh, we detected, we installed the, the sport trap like in mid uh, May. And during the first week of collection, we detect the spore in all three locations. 22, of course, was a wet year, wet, uh, wet spring, and delayed the planting date. In that uh, year, we collect 141 cartridge that was processed during the, during the eight week period. And we detect a, a spore since the first uh, collection day. In Kindred and Burley, 82, almost 83% of the collection date. And in Rainville, about 96% of the collection date, we found a Cercospora reticula in the membrane. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, for detection of the Cercospora reticula, we use a set of primer that detect the presence of the, muta uh, the mutation G142A that confer resistance to headline. This is a, a good set of primer that uh, is very specific for um, Cercospora. And in addition to detect the Cercospora, also uh, this primer gives us an um, estimate sensitivity to a uh, pyroclostrobin of the spore collected. So what we find out, there is a big difference sensitivity between the population tested at the beginning of the year compared to the sensitivity we report at the end of the season. This was valid for 21 and 22. So uh, here is the graph that is very interesting. If you see the first, um, the first uh, date is the profile of the spore uh, collected in that season to headline. So this is the end of the season of 2020. And then we have the profile of the spore we collected in 2021 across all the site. And we can see the resistant isolate really, we uh, end up with 68% of the spore being fully uh, being resistant to headline. And we found that only 13% of the spore are resistant to headline. And if you look in the bottom, which is the sensitive spore, we have 30% of the spore sensitive, when in 2001, we end up only with 1.2% of sensitive spore. Now, if we look at the end of the uh, 2021, we see we revert this little amount to all the ways to 75, and almost we don't have any susceptible isolate. Looking now at the year 22, beginning of the collection season, all the resistance almost disappear, being less than 1%, and we can see the spore that have uh, some degree of uh, sensitive is almost 70% of the isolate. So if we look what we find out at the end of last season, we see like almost 88% of the isolate are fully resistant or they are resistant to headline. And we lose almost all the 1% is just a sensitive one. Same happened, I mean, if we look by a, a cooperative, we see the same trend. We have a 13% at the beginning of the season and we end up with 83%. We have a fair amount of isolate that are sensitive to headline and almost less than 1% uh, that are sensitive. Same happened in MINDEC and uh, Southern MIN. This is for a uh, year 2021. Same for 2022. In this case, we have a little more we see a little more resistant or percentage of diastole that are resistant to headline. And we start about 10% in MINDEC and Southern MIN and a little more in um, 
in America at Grace Time. But you see also the susceptible one, there are very big percentage of them that are fully susceptible to the beginning of the season. So what is this difference? We are not sure. We see there is a fitness penalty that is, uh, for the score they carry the mutation. For some reason, they, so they don't survive the winter here. Or also we know in our previous work that uh, isolate that sensitive to health, uh, sensitive to all fungicide and the resist one, resistant one, uh, tend to uh, have a significant more um, sporulation, a lower temperature than the resistant one. And this is true until we reach a temperature about uh, 65 per, uh, uh, Fahrenheit. So maybe the fact that the resistant one don't germinate at early temperature, at a, a cold temperature, or just is a fit the penalty. So as a summary, we know that now that spores are present uh, in early spring, even in wet or dry spring, uh, infection uh, can be late in early in the growing season before we see the spot or the first sign of disease. Fungicide don't cure plants already infected with Cercospora veticula. Fungicide should be applied early in the season before the spots appear. We know spore germination is favored by the free moisture compared to high uh, relative humidity. And the morning dew during the early spring, during the spring is very common. There might be a bit a fit of penalty for Sarcosphora res, uh, re, with resistant and paroclostrobin that disappear during the, during the growing season. And we don't know the reason now, for now. And we plan to work uh, a little more on this in the future years. I uh, want to thank uh, to the Sugar Bill Research Education Board of Minnesota and North Dakota for the support, uh, the companies for uh, help us with the field work, and also uh, the uh, assistant of Jury Ren in our lab. Thank you. Our next talk is uh, entitled An Incidence of Plant Pathogens in Sugar Beet Storage, uh, being presented by Shyam Pandel with USDA ARS in Fargo. Thank you, Mark. Um, today I will be giving some uh, preliminary report on incidence of uh, plant pathogens in uh, sugar beet storage. Just the introduction here. Um, in the Red River Valley, uh, about 10 to 20 percent of the uh, total crop is harvested um, in early fall, and uh, those roots are uh, processed immediately without any storage. Uh, but uh, the remaining crop uh, is harvested in the month of uh, September, October. And uh, from that harvesting, about 20 to 30 percent of the crop uh, goes for uh, freezing. The remaining crop uh, uh, keep in a big storage piles uh, uh, in different location. If you uh, look at this map here, this is the map of North Dakota and Minnesota, and these each uh, orange dot represents the uh, sugar beet storage uh, piling location over the valley. And uh, in these storage, um, you know, preserving sucrose is a big challenge. Um, uh, high respiration and the storage disease uh, can um, cause uh, sucrose loss and the uh, uh, deterioration of the those storing um, the storing uh, roots. Uh, so the research objective of this study is uh, to identify and uh, characterize the post harvest pathogen in these uh, storage piles uh, and to assess the pathogenicity and the virulence spectrum of these uh, pathogens uh, in sugar beet cultivars. Uh, in this study, we collected uh, samples uh, from the factory yard and the storage piles here. Uh, this is the uh, one of the uh, uh, factory yard uh, that we collected samples. Uh, here we collected samples uh, from three different spots as you uh, see that, that indicating by those arrows. Um, we collected nearly uh, 150 root samples uh, that are uh, showing the visible symptoms of uh, microbial growth. And for the storage piles, we collected samples from the three different spots uh, from the top, uh, kind of medium and the bottom of the piles. Uh, and and uh, we collected the samples when um, uh, 
uh, these piles are opening up uh, and reloading the routes uh, from uh, piles to the factory. Uh, we collected samples uh, from the uh, right and the left soldier. And, uh, you know, uh, collecting samples from these parts is kind of challenge because uh, they are mm, huge. They are uh, more than um, 100, more than 1,000 uh, feet long, and uh, they are um, more than 20 feet tall. And uh, climbing and uh, getting the samples from the different uh, 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 parts of the file um, is not that easy, uh, but uh, we got the help from the factory people. Uh, they are very helpful. And, uh, these uh, the excavator that's uh, reloading the roots uh, from uh, storage piles to the factory that helped to scoop some of the samples from the uh, upper uh, layer of the pile, uh, so, uh, some from the kind of uh, in between uh, from top layer at the bottom, and he scooped uh, uh, those roots and uh, dump over here, and we collected the, uh, uh, those roots uh, that uh, with the visible symptoms of the uh, microbial growth. Uh, this is the kind of general workflow. We received those samples and uh, we collected the root tissues with the microbial growth. Um, we vigorously washed those uh, root tissues uh, with the uh, sterile water and uh, we plated those tissues on the nutrient over medium. A uh, few rounds of subculturing, we received the pure culture of the individual isolate. Um, and we are maintaining those isolate at um, negative 80 degree now, and we are uh, working from there. Um, so far, we have characterized uh, some of the isolates uh, that I'm going to share now. Uh, this is the list of the uh, 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 fungal isolates that uh, we identified so far. Uh, the uh, So far, we identified 23 fungal uh, um, isolates. Uh, uh, most of them are the uh, penicillium, uh, mucor, and some other uh, fungal pathogens. As uh, they are uh, shared in this slide before, uh, looks like that there is a significant overlap uh, in um, some of these uh, fungal pathogens. Um, this is the list of the fungal pathogen um, uh, that uh, so far we identified from the factory yard. Uh, um, as you see here, uh, the mucor is the kind of dominant uh, uh, fungal uh, uh, isolate um, in the case of uh, factory air. Uh, when we combine both uh, uh, from the uh, storage piles and the factory air, uh, uh, this is the summary about like 50% uh, of the uh, uh, incidence of those uh, 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 storage disease associated with the penicillium species, um, about like 20-22% uh, is associated with the mucor species and uh, uh, and with the, uh, some other species. Uh, for example, hypocrea uh, and trypoderma fusarium species. Uh, you, trypoderma and hypocrea, they are the uh, anamorphic and telomorphic of the same fungal species. Uh, we don't know which one is the uh, dominant one yet. And this is the list of the uh, bacterial isolates uh, uh, that have been identified so far. Uh, uh, as you look at those lists, uh, uh, some of the known bacteria uh, are here like Leucanoster, uh, Vulcanobacter, uh, basically in a sugar beet, uh, two groups of the bacteria, uh, lactic acid bacteria and acetic acid bacteria are uh, known to degrade the sucrose into the alcohol and acetic acid compound. Uh, probably uh, they are the, uh, uh, the uh, important uh, uh, bacterial isolates to degrade the um, uh, roots uh, in a storage. Uh, I don't have the concluding slide. Uh, this is, sorry. Uh, this is my last slide. Um, uh, as you see here, um, uh, Vulcanobacter is the uh, the most common bacteria, uh, followed by Pseudomonas, Ronella, Bacillus, and some other bacteria. Um, this is my last slide. Uh, we haven't done the pathogen pathogenicity test and uh, postulate verification yet. Uh, we are uh, doing that now. Um, uh, hopefully, I will have uh, those results, uh, and I'm happy to share those results uh, in my. Uh, future uh, conversation. Uh, with that, uh, I would like to uh, uh, very um, thankful to Sugarbeet Research and Education Board uh, for funding for this research. Uh, 
and I am also like to thank uh, Dr. Mohammad Khan uh, and the Future Hawk uh, uh, introducing me to the sugar beet cooperatives and helping me to um, get these samples uh, from different location. Uh, I would like to thank uh, my student Emma Nelson and uh, Connor Hayes. Um, uh, they helped um, to uh, uh, process those uh, root samples. Um, Emma is uh, here in the audience. Uh, if you get a chance, uh, please say hello to her. Uh, she is still working uh, in, in my lab. Um, uh, and uh, I also like to thank uh, my technician, um, Ella Montalvo. Uh, she has been uh, working uh, really hard in this project. Um, and I would like to thank um, uh, all of the uh, sugar cooperatives from the Red River Valley um, that helped me uh, successfully conduct this research. Uh, thank you. All right, our next presentation is entitled Horse Selection by Exposure to DMI Fungicide and Tank Mix Partner Combinations Reveals Variations in Genetic Diversity of Cercospora Particula Population. Uh, presented by Austin Lee and co-authored with Ashok Chanda. Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. So I hope most of you have been able to hear my presentation the last uh, two reporting sessions, because today I will be expanding beyond uh, the field trial I've conducted and discussing the impact that DMIs have on the genetic diversity and population structure of a Cercospora baticula population. So Cercospora baticula, is caused by the fungus, um, Cercospora leaf spot is caused by the fungus, Cercospora baticula. And you've heard an introduction from the other speakers here today, uh, and I'm sure many of you are aware of the destruction the disease can cause. But I just want to emphasize that even with the implementation of the new varieties we have available, uh, fungicide treatments are and will remain essential for maintaining healthy crops and high quality yields. Therefore, fungicide efficacy must be sustained for as long as possible by delaying the development of fungicide resistance. So I just first want to recap those um, inoculated field trials we conducted in 2020 and 2021, where we evaluated several DMI fungicides and tank mix partners and combinations of those products, um, <clears throat> in which we attempted to determine which treatments and which combinations provided the best Cercospora leaf spot control and allowed for the highest quality yields. And considering the two drastically different growing seasons we had in 2020 and 2021, where 2020 was very wet, we had very frequent rainfalls, and 2021 was almost record-breaking drought conditions, uh, we were very interested if we saw the same trends um, in both years of this field trial. So just first looking here, this is the DMI, this is disease progress for our DMI treatments. We evaluated uh, Proline, Inspire XT, Provisol, and Minerva, which is um, similar to Eminent as well. And we did see the same trends in both years. And we had this no DMI uh, treatment group, which reached, had the highest disease levels in both years. And this group um, includes treatments such as Mancozeb, copper, sulfur, and other tank mix partners. And then we do see the same trends where Minerva and Provisol um, are comparable in both years. And then Inspire XT and Proline are also comparable in both years. And next, looking at the disease progress for all of the tank mix partners, we see that Mancozeb and copper are providing the, are um, ending the season with the lowest amount of disease. Um, but also, we looked at uh, a foliar phosphate product and sulfur, and they did provide a reduction in disease compared to a no partner treatment as well. So compared to a, a DMI by itself. Uh, and the biological, uh, uh, we also looked at a biological product and um, by sodium bicarbonate. And that actually did provide some disease reduction in 2021 um, and for the most part in 2020. So ultimately, the aim of this field trial was to provide some practical information for growers and maybe add a, new, a few new tools to the toolbox uh, for managing Cercospora. But we're also interested in why we are seeing that differing performance between those treatments. And we're also very curious to how tank mix partners 
are playing a role in interfering with the development of DMI fungicide, our DMI fungicide resistance. And really what underlying molecular mechanisms of resistance are at play? And especially considering a majority of our knowledge is limited to only tetraconazole, which is eminent and Minerva, we're really interested in looking at these other DMI fungicides as well. And so this field trial also acted as a forced selection experiment in which uh, successive generations in a year were exposed to repeated fungicide applications because all of those fungicide treatments um, were repeatedly applied five times throughout the growing season. So just to set the stage a little bit better, I wanna take a quick moment and provide a brief explanation for how fungicide resistance evolves in a field. So at first, there's just a very small number of um, individuals in a fungal population that have mutations that have occurred randomly through natural processes. And some of these mutations will allow that fungus to survive a fungicide application. So when that specific fungicide is used, it will control almost all of the population except for the ones with the mutation. And over time, the individuals that survived and that are also fit will reproduce an increase in frequency within the population. I also wanna take a quick moment and explain the differences between the two main types of fungicide resistance. So the first is sometimes referred to as single step resistance here. And essentially, um, well, and this results from usually one mutation in the gene that the fungicide targets. And so essentially this is like a light switch. And once that light switch gets turned on, it confers complete resistance to that fungicide, which is what we see with the QOI or the strobilurin fungicides. But on the other hand, we have what's referred to as multi-step resistance. And this, um, and this results from several different mutations within the target site, but also involves several non-target genes. So as more mutations evolve over time, the more resistant a fungus can be to a certain fungicide. And this is what we see with the DMI fungicides or the triazoles. So to help us begin to answer those questions I posed in the earlier slide, we collected Circospora isolates from the field trial in 2020. Uh, and the first collection took place as soon as leaf spots began to develop, which was on uh, July 20th. And then we collected again at the end of the season on September 16th. And once again, uh, fungicide treatments were repeatedly applied five times throughout these two collection points. So, oops, once we had all of our peer cultures uh, and all of our DNA extracted, the next step is this DNA fingerprinting process. So essentially this process allows us to identify isolates that are genetically identical, and then um, as well as evaluate how closely related uh, each of the isolates are, which provides the information necessary to evaluate genetic diversity and population structure. So just to show you um, some of the diversity we found, this photo shows isolates uh, just collected in September and only from one treatment. And so each row here represents um, four isolates collected from the same replicate of the field trial. And the isolates that have the same number are genetically identical. And what's interesting is that we see those identical isolates showing up in multiple replicates of the field trial. And this just offers strong evidence that the fungicides are selecting for, the, for some of the same individuals. And here, uh, just to recap, we've, we did 16 isolates from this one treatment and nine of them were unique individuals. So the first bit of data I wanted to show is the variation we see between the two time points. So we were able to get data for, from 237 isolates that were collected in July. And of those, um, well, and these are represented by this blue peak and also hidden in the background here. And of those, we found 59 unique individuals. And for the most part, this population was actually dominated um, by one particular unique individual. And for the September collection, 
we were able to get um, information from 497 isolates. And among, of those, we found 120 unique individuals. But what's really interesting is that we only see 34 unique individuals um, are found in both of the time points. And that's represented by this overlapping peak here in the middle. And uh, that means that only half of the individuals did not survive uh, that repeated fungicide application. And 34 of them were able to survive those five repeated applications. So the next figure here is a dendrogram of the Cercospora isolates that were exposed to the DMI fungicide treatments and collected in only September. So we're only looking at the end of the season now. And here we start to see some very strong groupings where the isolates exposed to Minerva and Proline are actually clustered together. Well, the isolates exposed to Provisol and Inspire XT are also grouped together and are diverging from those other isolates. And the isolates that were not exposed to a DMI are just kind of off, off by themselves. So here we're still looking at the samples collected in just September, so just the end of the season, um, but categorized by their exposure to those tank mix partners. And what we see here is that there's just very little divergence um, between those treatments, except for Mancozeb. So Mancozeb is kind of off by itself, separating out from the others. But what, um, what we should take note of here is that the scale here for genetic distance is actually four times smaller than the genetic distance when we look at the DMI treatments. So these are all much more closely uh, related. So <clears throat> next, now this is a, uh, we're still looking at the end of the season, and this is a discriminant analysis of principal components. And first, what we did is remove any prior assumptions of uh, treatment exposure. So I, I'm essentially just giving all these isolates to the computer and telling the computer, uh, you tell me where they belong. And the first thing we had to do is determine that three main clusters that you see here uh, best represent that population structure. Um, and so once we have these three clusters, I wanted to see what individuals fall into each cluster. And so we begin to see the same similar groupings here, uh, where when we look at cluster number one, it's predominantly um, isolates exposed to proline and Minerva. And when we look at cluster number two, we see a similar trend in Spire XT and Provisol are treatments exposed, isolates exposed to those treatments um, are mostly found in that cluster. But in, we also have this third cluster here where there just doesn't really see, seem to be uh, any clear connection to those DMI treatments. So here are the same three, oops, yeah, the same, same three clusters um, shown in the last photo, but now we're trying to fit the isolates that were exposed to the tank mix partner treatments. And we see here as well that there really isn't any connection between those three groupings and the exposure to the different tank mix partners. So based on these findings, it seems that DMI fungicides provide a much stronger selection pressure on the population compared to the tank mix partners. And the DMIs are really the main force influencing population structure. Additionally, the strong, yeah, the strong, uh, the strong groupings that we see or the strong clustering that we see with, uh, with isolates exposed to DMIs suggests that there may be a very high risk of cross resistance. You know, and based on um, information, especially from Gary Secor's lab, uh, we know that Inspire XT and Provisol may have some similarities, but based on this, it seems that there may be a high risk of cross resistance to Minerva and Proline as well. And on the other hand, the lack of, um, the lack of clustering we see with isolates exposed to tank mix partners suggests that the risk of cross resistance between contact fungicides is very unlikely. So by looking at genetic, and genetic diversity and population structure, we have strong evidence that the population is highly differentiated at the DMI exposure level. 
And now we can start to investigate hypotheses as to why these populations are so differentiated, such as what mechanisms are leading to cross resistance and in what way do fungicide mixtures interfere with the development of DMI resistance. So to really evaluate uh, the effect of these combinations, our fungicides, we need to first get fungicide sensitivity values from each of the isolates. And to do this, we've also developed a new protocol for uh, fungicide sensitivity testing that is more efficient in the use of resources and time. And by doing this, we measure absorbance of fungal cultures growing in microplates that you see here in the background. Uh, we'll also start sequencing whole genomes for all of the unique individuals we found so we can conduct a genome-wide association study to see what genes are most associated with fungicide sensitivity. So with that, I would just like to thank the Sugar Beet R&E Board for funding. I'd like to thank the many companies for chemical product and seed, especially for the field trial. I'd also like to thank everyone involved with collecting all of these leaf spots and helping with lab work. And uh, a big shout out to Dr. Nathan Wyatt and John Neubauer for answering a lot of my questions and helping me get started uh, with this part of the project. And thank you to my advisor, Dr. Ashok Chanda. So if I have any uh, time, um, I welcome any questions. Our next talk mm -hmm. is impact of Chicago leaf spot on surgery root storage, final report. That's being presented by Dr. Karen Kubik and uh, co authored with Mohammed Khan, John I, Peter Hawk, and Abbas Bhatta. Well, thank you, Mark. It's a real pleasure to be here today and to be able to present some of the research that we've been doing over the last several years. Um, this is a project that uh, I'm standing in the wrong place, apparently. <laughs> um, this is a project uh, that's really kind of a joint project between Muhammad and, and me. It's been known for many, many years, and there's been many, many studies that have shown that Circospora has a, a large ep economic impact on sugar beets at harvest. It's known that Circospora reduces root yield as well as reducing sucrose content. What's not known, however, is how Circospora affects storage. There's a lot of anecdotal evidence that suggests that having severe Circospora during the production season affects the storage of the roots after harvest. But there really hasn't been any uh, large studies or, or comprehensive studies that have been conducted with Circospora infected roots or roots from plants that have been infected with Circospora and how they respond to storage. And yet we really do need to know what the effect of CLS is on storage because it has huge implications for both storage and processing. What we really need to know is, is there a level of disease severity that would impact storage to such an extent that you wouldn't want to store the beets? That, that's the first question. The other is, is if, if there is an effect of CLS on storage, is there an advantage to segregating the beets from the regular piles so that they could be processed earlier to avoid losses during storage? It's also important to know if there's any changes in quality in these beets during storage because that, that affects what happens in the, the factory and, and any adjustments that they need to, to make for any increased level in impurities. So we teamed up with Muhammad. Muhammad really does the first half of the study and, we, and my lab does the second half of the study. Muhammad does all the field work and the production of beets with different levels of Circospora. And uh, what every year for uh, Muhammad gives to us is our beets that have four levels of disease severity of Circospora. Uh, he gets this by taking a CLS susceptible variety planting it in field plots out in uh, near Fox home. Um, those plants are then grown up, inoculated with seed baticula infected leaves uh, about mid-July. And then Muhammad uses different regimes of fungicides to get different levels of control. Um, right before harvest, the beets are rated on a one to 10 scale with one being healthy beets and 10 being very severely infected with, um, with um, defoliation due to Circospora. After raiding, the beets are harvested and, har and Muhammad then gives them to us in our lab 
where we take these beets and put them into a storage study. The beets are stored under controlled environment conditions. So we store them at 5C or about 41 degrees Fahrenheit at a constant temperature and at high humidity, which is a good storage conditions for sugar beets. Uh, we store them for up to 120 days and we evaluate them at harvest as well as after 30, 90, and 120 days in storage. Uh, what we're looking at in these storage studies is root respiration rate. We're looking at how much sucrose they lose in storage. Uh, we also quantify the accumulation of invert sugars, as well as looking at sucrose loss to molasses or any changes in sucrose loss to molasses and any changes in recoverable sugar uh, per ton. Uh, the, the last point is that uh, we've got three years of data now and the, the year is, or we, the, the study has been completed. And so this is the final report. And I thought because the results from these three years of, of study have been so clear and, and so consistent that I just kind of cut to the chase and go to the conclusions first, and then we'll go back and look at the data. And uh, the conclusion is, is that we saw nothing happening with beets that were infected with Cercospora as far as any changes in their storage properties. And it was irrespective of the severity of CLS. And we saw these same results in each of the three years. And so I'm, I may be getting ahead of us, be getting ahead of things, but based on what we saw in these three years of study is there's really no reason from what we saw this is to think that you need to take any special precautions during storage with beets that come from Cercospora infected plants. Um, so that's the conclusion. So um, this is actually the data of what we've got. What's shown here is the respiration rate. Uh, there's three graphs. So there, a graph for each year, year one, two, and three. In the first year, we had CLS ratings. We had these four different levels of disease severity. In the first year, our low group we had a rating of 3.0 and the most severe, severely infected roots had a 9.8. So we had very severely infected roots. Year two, the CLS ratings were very similar, 3.0 to 8.8 .8 for the highest CLS rating. And year three, there was a little, there was a higher incidence of disease or a more a higher severity of disease. And the CLS ratings ranged from five and a half to 10. Um, what we did is we looked at, so these four bar, these groups of four bars of the, the four different severities of CLS symptoms from which these roots were derived. And we're looking at the respiration data at 30, 30 days, 90 days and 120 days in storage. And the first thing you might notice is that there really isn't any pattern when you're looking at these groups of four. Uh, sometimes you see an increase, you see it here. Sometimes it looks like it's going down. Sometimes it's doing something else. And when you, and the reason for that is because what you're seeing are these small differences in respiration rate, but it's noise in the data. None of these changes are statistically significant. So it didn't matter if we had beats that came from the groups that, with a Cercospora rating of 3.0 or at a 10, we weren't seeing any significant difference in storage respiration rate. And we didn't see it at 30, 90, or 120 days in storage. It's well known that Cercospora causes sucrose to be lower at harvest. And that's what's shown here in the slide. So we, you know, there's nothing interesting here really, because this is well known. If you have high levels of Cercospora, you're gonna have a lower sucrose content at harvest. But what we were interested in is, do the sucrose levels change more or less if you have more or less Cercospora? And so we're looking here in, in the second half of the slide or on the right panel, at the sucrose loss during storage. And again, what, uh, the first point to make is none of these beets in any of these years really lost that much sucrose during 120 days of storage. Uh, the most we saw was about a little bit less than a 1% loss 
in sucrose content based on fresh weight. So regardless of severity, we didn't lose much sucrose to over 120 days. And there's no relationship between the severity of CLS with the sucrose that was lost. And again, what we're seeing again is, you know, we see variations, but it's, it's just at the level of noise. There, there's nothing statistically significant in any of, any of these differences. We also looked at invert sugars. Uh, at harvest, we didn't really see a whole lot of difference between beets with low levels of sucrospora and beets that had high levels of sucrospora. Uh, there were a little bit of variation, but that, the variation was more year to year variation. And again, none of these differences based on sucrospora rating are statistically significant. We also looked at how invert sugars change during storage. And again, we see year to year differences, but not differences that are related to sucrospora rating. Um, so if you look at the, the top panel, we saw an increase in the inverts in year one, really no change in inverts in year two, and a decline in invert sugars during storage in year three. But again, none of these changes in invert sugar concentrations are related to CLS ratings. Sucrose loss to molasses um, was variable at harvest time. And that actually matches what, with what we've seen in literature. Some people have seen that sucrospora causes an increase in sucrose loss to molasses. Some people have seen no effect. Um, we saw a, a very inconsistent effect in that year one, uh, regardless of sucrospora rating, the sucrose loss to molasses at time of harvest was was pretty much the same. At year two, it was a little bit elevated in the beets that had the higher sarcospora rating. And in year three, strangely, it was a little bit lower, but it was statistically significant. And again, really our interest though is, is what's going on in storage. And you could just look at the three graphs. You can see, look at the four bars in those four graphs and they're all pretty much the same. And, and again, we're seeing no effect of, of CLS rating on, the, on any sucrose loss in molasses or any changes in sucrose loss to molasses that occurred during storage. So essentially nothing happened as far as sucrose loss to molasses. The last trait we looked at is recoverable sugar. Um, again, this is something that's well known at harvest. You have lower levels of re recoverable sugar per ton in beets that have high levels of sucrospora. So we, we saw exactly which, what you would expect here, where our two higher ratings of sucrospora have lower recoverable sugar per ton at harvest. But again, you know, it's what's going on in storage. So what's shown in this panel is the change in recoverable sugar per ton after 120 days of storage. And you can see, while well, you may, it may look like there's a little bit of an increase here in year three, um, there's really no consistent effect of, of CLS rating on the amount of recoverable sugar that's lost in during the storage period. Okay, so just a quick recap. You've already seen the conclusion. Um, so this is just uh, what you saw before. Sarcospora leaf spot has no detectable effect on the sugar beet uh, root storage properties, at least nothing that we could pick up in our studies. And it doesn't seem to matter how severe the rating is because we've had some, we had severely diseased beets in all three years of the study. And again, that leads you to, to conclude or to assume that there's really no special precautions that need to be taken with beets that are um, derived from CLS infected plants. Um, if anybody's interested, all the full details of this research is available online. It's, it's been published. And with that, I'd like to thank the Research and Education Board, which funded all three years of this research. Our next presentation is identification of new genetic sources from CB to improve sugar beet resistance to their cost leaf spot. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Masab. As I just said, I'm a postdoc and working with Dr. Chengen's group. And here I'll be giving you an update on our project, which is to identify the genetic sources of resistance in wild beet or sea beet 
to improve the resistance in sugar beets. So uh, first, uh, uh, a brief uh, background on Sarcospora as uh, many of the before participants have already given, but I'll just go through it. Uh, so Sarcospora is uh, the most important foliar disease in sugar beet and it can cause uh, yield loss up to 50%, but the economic losses are, are also you know, much higher because of the high processing cost that it causes. And uh, the host resistance in uh, CLS is both quantitative and qualitative. And recently uh, we have uh, seen a CR plus gene, which is a monogenic gene, and this gene is actually also derived from the wild beet, the C beet. Uh, so it will be interesting uh, to look more genes in that, uh, you know, in that germplasm collection. So right now in sugar beet, we still have the lack of the resistance genes. This is our whole aim, you know, to go and see if we can find more resistance sources in the wild beet. So the uh, wild beet or the beta meritama is the progenitor of all the sugar beet that we have right now. And for that reason, uh, we believe that since they have been co-evolved with all the diseases, uh, there should be resistance present in them at present as well. So uh, we tested uh, the historic evaluations uh, and we find out that out of the 792 accessions, 132 were resistant with the disease rating of three and less, which is very promising. And uh, this is just uh, a tree graph showing the differentiation of the 2000 sugar beet, not just sugar beet, the accessions of beet uh, in the NPGS database. And we found out that the beta meritama ones, the wild beet, which is uh, right here, is the 355 lines, which were very separate away from the other sugar beet accessions. So uh, we know the sugar beet is a very you know, new crop. The inception is just 200 years old. And compared to the other crops, it does not have the tools available at the breeders disposable to play with. So having this kind of germplasm, which is away and having a distinct genetic diversity, which is really uh, could be helpful in finding new loci for diseases and pests. So, this, the, so our focus is on this part to find if we can, uh, to see if we can find new resistance sources on the sea beet. Uh, some, a little background on the genome-wide association studies. So genome-wide association studies, it uses SNPs, which covers the whole genome and it, you, uh, and it links it with the trait. So we have a trait, which is a phenotype, and then we have a genotypic data in the form of SNPs. We try to find out if there is a genomic region, which is associated between the both phenotype and the genotype. Uh, the advantage of this is that uh, here you don't need to make a cross, you don't need to make a breeding population or a biparental population. Uh, you just need a diverse set of accessions which could be readily used in the uh, field, which is, a, which is a very big pro, uh, especially in sugar beet, uh, because sugar beet is highly heterozygous and to make a uh, you know, biparental homozygous lines uh, is difficult. So GVAS could give us a really high insight into the, uh, to find the common alleles, uh, which we can uh, use later on for integration in sugar beets. The objective of our studies uh, were to find the resistant CLS lines in the wild beets, and then de uh, develop the DNA markers. Uh, sorry, first we will do the GWAS studies. Uh, we will see if those, uh, those phenotypic data that resistance is associated to the SNPs. And if we find any genomic regions, if they are, at, uh, if, if they are linked with each other, we will make, uh, convert them into DNA markers. And then those DNA markers, once uh, se selected and made, could be used in the breeding programs and which could be assisted uh, in a way that uh, we will save not just the time and we will have uh, high precision in making the true hybrids. The next step will be to identify the candidate genes to understand the possible mechanism of the host resistance. In our study, we had 602 uh, accessions total. And these accessions were collected from 25 different countries divided into seven uh, geographic regions. 
I'll just go through with the results of the genotypic data first. So we uh, did the genomic uh, genotype by sequencing for all the Maritima lines, and we had almost 500K uh, the raw SNP data. After thinning and filtering, we got with 147,000 SNPs, which were uh, spread it across all the nine genomes. And the density of this was almost 3.5 KB per SNP, which is very good, actually. This is the population structure analysis that we did. Uh, it's based on the seven regions that we did. And as expected, uh, we see that the, the the lines which were from the same origin, uh, for example, we see Southern Europe here has more incidence of the lines which are from that region. And uh, the admixture that we found was from the same geographic proximity. If you see in the Western uh, Europe, we have the Western Europe and also we have the Northern Europe. Similarly, in Northern Europe, we have Northern Europe and then the Western Europe lines. And the same pattern you observe in Southern Europe and Africa. If we look at the population structure at the country level, because some of the countries had higher number of exceptions than to uh, than some other countries. So we see interestingly that one country that popped out was Denmark here, had no admixture at all, and Morocco. The rest of the countries, for example, United Kingdom has admixture with France and uh, Ireland, which are actually neighboring countries. So it makes sense. Similarly with Italy and Greece and Ireland. So we did again the population structure using the 602 maritima lines that we did. And we found the same, um, we observed the same results as previously we had before with the whole set of germplasm, the 2000 lines. And these two clusters that we observed before were very much significant here. And we see that those two were similarly separated out. So this uh, is a graph showing uh, the countries based population structure and the regional based. Uh, the, the, the whole purpose here to show it is that maybe some countries have the lines which have higher resistance compared to the other countries. For example, here, this France, United Kingdom, Ireland had the highest resistance percentage, including Italy as well. And this Denmark line, uh, there were 21 lines from Denmark and 16 of them, actually 14 of them, were highly resistant. So which gives you know a good idea that this Denmark has a very distinct genetic structure and also has high resistance. So maybe this is a good source that could be utilized. So we tested our 600 accessions in Foxholm, uh, Minnesota, and we detected 236 lines, which were found to be highly resistant with disease rating of one to three on a rating scale of one to nine, which is uh, a high number, good number. 33 of the lines were highly susceptible and the rest of the lines were moderately resistant and moderately susceptible. If we look at the disease incidence or CLS rating on the regional scale, uh, we see that almost all the countries have the higher uh, ratings up to seven. But uh, you know, I mean, these countries, they had only few lines. So I mean, they are not very significant here. The important was the Denmark that we studied, then Italy, it has a higher number of uh, resistance percentages and as well as France and England. So we did the preliminary GWAS studies and we found out that there were 15 SNPs associated with the phenotype on 14 genomic regions across all nine chromosomes. And these were the results of those 15 SNPs. The, the, these SNPs explained up to 4.5% of the phenotypic variation. After that, we did a genome scan in the nearby regions of those uh, SNPs to see if we can find any or we can predict any gene uh, which could be responsible for the resistance. So we found some uh, genes which are directly responsible or directly involved in disease defense mechanism and the other genes which were not directly you know, or you can say which were indirectly involved in disease resistance. So in conclusion, uh, we had identified 236 lines with disease resistance of three or less. 
And these resistance excitations uh, may be associated with the geographic region where they are from, which has to be looked further on. And the JIVAS, uh, we detected 15 SNPs. And these SNPs uh, will be, I mean, they, uh, we will have another data next year and we will see if these SNPs remain uh, in the next year as well in the next application. And if it happens, then we will have an idea of uh, we will see the, uh, if we can convert those SNPs into the markers. For next, we will focus on the 300 lines that uh, had the highest disease uh, ratings. Sorry, by highest, I mean the highest resistance rating. And uh, we will test them again in replications in multiple locations. And we will use control conditions this time. We'll try to do more inoculations, so to produce uh, higher disease pressure with a uh, missing education system and and, and disease and other practices. So this was all. I'm, I'm, I would like to thank all my team members and also uh, Dr. Melvin Bolton, the group, Dr. Changan, who's my advisor, and Sugar Beet R&D, and to all of you. Thank you so much for being here. Okay, our next paper is evaluating C. particular populations over time to determine fungicide resistance in sugar beet, being presented by Sushmita Kalika Singh and co-authored with Dr. Khan. So my name is Sushmita Kalika Singh. I am a first year PhD student in the plant pathology department at NDSU. My advisor is Dr. Mohammed Khan. And my task this afternoon is to walk you through my presentation, which is based on an evaluation of Sarcospora baticola populations over time to determine fungicide resistance in sugar beet. This is the outline in which the presentation will follow, which includes a brief introduction to sugar beet, some soil-borne or foliar diseases affecting sugar beet, especially Sarcospora baticola, the use of fungicide mixtures and CR plus varieties to control or manage Sarcospora baticola and the future direction. So let's get into, into it. Beta vulgaris, commonly known as a sugar beet, is commonly produced as a source of sugar. The juice of sugar beet contains high level of sucrose. And although um, the commercial use of sugar beet is for processed sugar, there are several other uses of sugar beet. Um, the process of processing the beets to sugar, um, the byproducts, molasses and pulp, they can be used as a livestock feed and they can be used in commercial baking and pharmaceuticals. This map is showing some of the states that produces sugar beets uh, in light blue. And here we can see North Dakota and Minnesota. And the red is showing the states that have sugar beet factories. In 2020, Minnesota produced the most sugar beets in the states, followed by Idaho and North Dakota. And from this table, we can see if we add the production from Minnesota and North Dakota, they produce approximately 50% of the sugar beets in the states. So um, some soil-borne or foliar diseases that affects sugar bees are aphanomyces, which causes root rot, rhizomania, which also affects the root, fusarium, which causes fusarium yellows, claritinia, sclerotinium, which causes leaf blight, sarcospora, and alternaria leaf spots. However, the main focus of today is a sarcospora leaf spot, which you already heard a lot about. And um, this is caused by Sarcoscopora baticola, and it poses as one of the biggest production problems in North Dakota and Minnesota, because this disease results in lower tonnage as well as um, lower sucrose concentrations, which could result in losses of up to 40 percent. Um, this fungus, it spreads from field to field by wind and it, the infections developed rapidly in warm and wet conditions. This disease is favored at a temperature range from 25 to 32 degrees Celsius and with the 
relative humidity being more than 85%. And individual um, spots, sorry, individual spots, they usually occur on older leaves and then they progress to younger leaves. And the spots, they are usually ash color in the center and they are um, purple or brown on the borders and they are circular to oval shaped. So this is what a healthy field, a sugar beet field looks like from 2020 in Southern Minnesota. However, this is what a, an unhealthy sugar beet field looks like when it's infected with um, Sarcospora leaf spots, which um, gives the plants the appearance of being burnt and scorched. And um, the varieties used here were the normal commercial varieties that are available to growers. And these varieties, they are becoming resistant to individual fungicides such as DMI and QOIs. And this graph, it is showing the effects of individual fungicides on Sarcospora leaf spot severity and the recoverable sucrose. And here you could see in the um, non-treated check that the recoverable sucrose was under 10,000 pounds per acre and the severity was 10 and anything above 5.5 5 .5 severity is considered as an economic threshold to growers. But when we use um, the individual fungicides such as Inspire, which is a DMI, you can see that even here, um, the severity of 5.5 .5 is exceeded. However, um, when we use uh, fungicide in mixtures and they are alternated, we can have um, better results. And this year was a very wet year and the conditions were favorable for Sarcospora leaf spot. And um, again, we can see that the non-treated check had a severity of 10, but when we use fungicide in mixtures, the severity dropped to 5.5 um, and the recoverable sucrose per acre increased to approximately 5,000. And here this picture is showing how the favorable environment conditions resulted in severe disease severity from September 2nd through September 24th at Foxholm with the CLS rating being more than five. And um, when the conditions are dry, this was a dry year. Um, if we use fungicides in mixtures and they are alternated, we would have even better results than the wet year. And again, we see that the non-treated check, the severity was 10. But when we use the fungicides in mixtures and they are alternated, the severity dropped below 5.5, .5, ranging from 3.8 to 4.3. And the recoverable sucrose per ton, it increased to over 13,000 pounds per acre. And these pictures, they are showing what was stated. And you can see from the non-treated check that when we use the fungicide and mixtures, they perform better. And this picture is showing um, a field trial where individual fungicides and fungicides in mixtures were used. They were applied five times and it was found that only the fungicides used in mixtures were effective and they can this can be seen in the areas where we are seeing less severity. And this picture is showing another trial where fungicide mixtures alone were used in rotation. And we can see clearly that this um, what more um, treatments were effective here compared to the previous. And um, if we want, since the weather can be unpredictable and we can protect our sugar beet 
from Sarcospora basicola by using CR plus varieties, which Dr. Seeker would have mentioned earlier. And this variety is better to use because it is somewhat tolerant or resistant to Sarcospora baticola and it um, produces better results, uh, production and protection from the disease. And also this variety can um, reduce the number of fungicide application used because, and uh, keep the disease to a minimum, which can be seen here. And we have two CR plus varieties, which are the ACH, which can be seen on top, and the BTS or the beta variety, which is at the bottom. And for each um, variety, we have two treatments where for each where we have a non-treated check. And here we have a treatment where um, applications of fungicide was done before row closure and then at 28 days interval. And then um, fungicide were applied as needed, which means they were applied when spots were seen. And this graph is explaining the data from gathered from that. And it is actually showing us that not all of the CR plus varieties are the same. Here we can see that the ACH variety is performing better because the recoverable sucrose is higher compared to the beta. And also we can see that in both, you don't need to apply um, fungicides at 28 days interval because when they were applied as needed, they produced the same result as when it was applied at intervals. This picture is showing what the non-treated check would look like if we use the normal commercial varieties. And this picture is showing what the non-treated checks look like if we use the CR plus varieties, which clearly shows that this is a better variety to use. And um, Dr. Khan and his team, they have been collecting samples with infected infection for the past seven years. And I will be using those samples to determine in laboratory and greenhouse the temperature and humidity required for the pseudostromata of Sarcospora baticola to germinate and cause infection on healthy sugar beets, to determine the presence or absence of gene mutations from Sarcospora baticola populations exposed to the major fungicide classes such as DMIs and QOIs, and to evaluate the two CR plus varieties for the levels of susceptibility to different Sarcospora baticola populations. Okay, uh, the next paper is optimal, entitled Optimizing Fungicide Timing for Management of Sarcospora Leaf Spot in Sugar Beet CR plus varieties, uh, being presented by Sunil Bandari, and it's co authored by Luis Del Rio Mendoza and Mohamed Khan. Thank you so much. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm Sunil Bandari, a PhD student at NDSU, and my supervisor is Dr. Khan. And today I'll be presenting on um, optimizations of fungicide applications for management of Sarcospora leaf spurs on CR plus varieties. The two CR plus varieties recently re uh, released by uh, KWS. And here is the basic outline of my uh, presentation today. I will like to skip the introductions because we already knew a lot about the sugar beets, its uh, growing reasons and many other things. So, Sarcospora leaf spots, this is actually a very uh, well-known picture. We know its life cycle. Generally, the Dispose when they get the way, uh, sorry, when they dispose into a susceptible host, sugar beets, they will germinate and penetrate through the stomata and enter inside the leaf tissue and produces this characteristic spots, which we call Sarcospora leaf spots. And within these spots, there may be hundreds of pseudo stomata, which are actually a conidogenous cell that can produce thousands of, okay, that can produce thousands of. Conidia, which again disseminates into the field and produce the cycle again and again. So this cycle typically we call polycyclic cycle. And again, when this happens, the polycyc uh, polycyclic onset occurs, the field will turn into a bronze and we 
uh, then that again, this zero stomata again overwinters, and then in the next season, when they get the suitable environment, they produce the conidia and the cycles keep continue. So uh, I think the pixel quality is a little lower, I think, but we all aim to get this healthy field. And this is what happens when the field is infected with Sarcospora. And we need a better management practices. And we know some management practices like integrated practices when, in which we use crop rotations and incorporations of the infected residues. Uh, these uh, can reduce the chances of infections, but that cannot fully uh, re reduce the chances. For that, we want to get a better resistance through host resistance and also the fungicides. So today we will see both of them, how the new varieties that, ha that has been developed by KWS uh, reacts in response to varietal response as well as the fungicide applications. And these ACS 973 and beta 7029 is the recent product produced by KWS using the beta maritima, which is actually a wild type CLS resistant plant. And they incorporate this CLS resistant trait into our commercial cultivar. And then through the continuous back, uh, back rows and selections, they finally produce these two varieties. And it took actually 21 years for this production. So it offers uh, a stronger circus productions, even in the higher disease pressures. And also the yield uh, performance is similar to the current cultivar. So the objective today is to see the uh, fungicide efficacy of uh, the common fungicide that we use on these two varieties. And we'll also see the fungicide efficacy on current cultivar, uh, commercial cultivar Crystal 572. So for this research, we have started plantations on 23rd of May. And on 8th of July, we inoculated the field with all the plants with Sarcospora inoculum using the previous year leaf residue, infected leaf residue. And we apply the fungicide as needed, as needed and based on our plan. We actually plan 10 treatment strategies. I will show you later. And finally, on 27th of September, we harvested. And here you can see the list of fungicides, the fungicide mixes that we have used during this research. We have started with supertin and bas mixtures. Then if needed, we go with this another mode of actions fungicides. We are just rotating the fungicides so as to reduce the chances of getting uh, fungicide resistance. So for treatment strategies, we have 10 treatment strategies with non-treated con non control as we pass. Then we have one treatment at before row closure using 10 to 14 days calendar interval. Then we have three treatment at row closure using 10 to 14 days interval with 20 years day inter interval calendar and based on the daily infection value that we monitor from and on. And we have another three sets of treatment at disease onsets. We'll apply fungicide with 10 to 14 days calendar interval at disease onsets with 20 days interval at disease onset. And we'll start looking at DIV again. If the DIV threshold goes beyond six, which is actually called the threshold for CLH, then we'll apply the fungicides. And finally, the three to 5% severity level if the plant reaches at three to 5% severity level, then we'll apply fungicides with 10 to 14 days interval. And if this, uh, uh, after reaching three to 5% severity, if the DIV goes beyond six, we'll again apply the fungicides. Uh, I think uh, uh, he was asking about like, what is the actually as needed for applications? These are the as needed, like if the threshold reach beyond DIV, that is the as needed. If the threshold raised to three to five percent, these are the treatment we have planned this year. So this is actually our uh, field at Paxom, Minnesota. This is beta 7021 and ACS 973. These two are the CR plus, and we compare all our answers with current commercial cultivar Crystal 572, which is actually a successful one. 
So we uh, it's, uh, we inoculated pathogens on uh, 9 of July, and the plots, it is not well clear here, but they don't have any pathogen or onsets at July 15. Again, they don't have any pathogens at August 1, but on August 6, the crystal developed the first symptoms in the field. Uh, I put the data database on the 15 days interval, but on August 6, we have first spots on crystal. And these uh, CR plus variety developed spots two weeks later on August 20. So these have a delayed sarcospora induction based on, uh, sorry, compared to current uh, commercial cultivar. And on August 31st, those two fields still look more healthy and green, but this has turned into a yellow and a little bit brown. So the incidence rate was very high in crystal compared to this to CR plus. So here are some pictures we have been to in our we have been to our field at uh, 13th of August for our extension tour, and I think many of us were there at that time. The plots at that time that look really uh, green and healthy. But after two weeks, when we have our another tour at that field, the plot has turned into brown and scorsy. And it is, you can see in the other screen, and you can see the plots in the back of Dr. Khan, Dr. Khan they were turned yellow and brown. So the yield potential of these two uh, variety when compared with the CR plus, you can see the yield or cultivar mean between, between crystal and the beta 7029 is not statistically significant, but it's a little bit uh, different in numerical term. But uh, ACS 973 has little lower yield at this time. And if we see out of 10 treatment, we have applied the treatment six and nine were statistically different. Otherwise, all the treatment were not that different. And this data, the crystal has more yield compared to other two CR plus variety. It was really uh, resembles the data that Dr. Sand recently presented because the Eastern count on this one has uh, significantly higher. Normally I have data. Uh, the SU beta 7029 has a stand count of 142 and SUS 973 has 149, but the crystal has 192. So this high stand count contributes to the high in potential of uh, crystal 572 this year. And the research conducted by Dr. Khan in previous years shows that if we have a dry wet, uh, dry late season, in growing uh, in dry wood season, the potential of crystal yield gets maximum. Similarly, num uh, based on the number of applications, you can see this is for CR plus variety, both of them. The treatment one is untreated control and treatment nine and 10, we applied when the severity reached at three to 5%. So in both of them, the severity never, even in the control, it never reached to three to 5%. So we don't have any applications on nine to 10 treatment. And the uh, CLS rating, you can see it was below two, two in beta or C, uh, CR plus varieties. So based on our schedule or plan, we applied the fungicide. Even it wasn't that significant to say, like we, we actually need say, uh, fungicide applications with uh, in 2022, since we have very less disease pressure at that time and disease started very, uh, very late. So uh, if the year is like 2022, we actually don't need to spray on CR plus beta 7029 and ACS 973. While if we look at this crystal 572, the untreated control, which doesn't have any treatment, it has the disease potential, uh, disease severity of 8.8, .8, and we have to apply to the three to 5% severity. Even the disease potential was very low, but they crossed the three to 5% severity, so we applied. And this was so, this shows that 
uh, the treatment after reaching three to five percent threshold is not effective to control the disease because severity is above seven. But there are some treatment these which are done at before row closure and after row closure, and they have more treatment compared to other. These treatments are actually good for controlling CLS. You can see the CLS rating is very low. But if we look at the application cost, because they have higher treatment, the application cost was really high. And there are two other treatment, treatment seven and eight. If we look, the CLS rating is still under the economic threshold. So, and if we see the uh, application time, we applied four times in uh, four times CLS, uh, sorry, treatment six and three times treatment eight. The cost for these applications is just under $70. So if we are using Crystal 572, these two treatment can, gi uh, can give a better control. But if we wait for a later, uh, later applications, then the cost is almost comparable, but the disease intensity or uh, disease severity will increase very high. And you may wonder like how the cost of four treatment in this case is just under 70 and the same, the three treatment in treatment five was 105 because we are using mixer fungicides and in rotations, the mixers, the cost of the fungicides makes this difference. So uh, these are the real results. So beta 7029 uh, when treated treatment five with three applications, the plant has disease under uh, 1.5. Its control shows very untreated control actually has very less spots. You can see. Similarly, the ACS71 treatment with uh, treatment four with three treatment or uh, three applications has no disease. And the control has also, the untreated control has very less disease, but the crystal, the similar results we only get after six applications with treatment two, which was at before row closure. And the untreated control has very high disease, which are above seven. So in summary, uh, the ACS 793 and uh, beta 7029 were significantly tolerant to the CLS compared to the standard susceptible crystal. And in susceptible variety, calendar-based treatment, prior row closure and after row closure seems to control effectively, but it is not seems economically viable because the uh, application cost is higher. Uh, the disease severity on CR plus variety never raised three to 5%. So if we have year like uh, 2022, disease induction was late and disease density, uh, sorry, disease uh, 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 severity was low. We actually don't need any applications at that time, but we need to monitor our crop frequently. And the sugar yield was higher in susceptible variety as Dr. Chan also mentions. There are some reasons, uh, late uh, season dry environments and high stand count contributes to the high sugar weight potential. But if we have a late weight season, then CR plus showed the higher, higher yield potential. Dr. Khan already uh, con sorry, conducted that experiment last year. And further recommendations for CR uh, Crystal 572, we can recommend the applications uh, with 28 days calendar interval and this is answered followed by DIV, which is actually four, uh, four applications and two applications can give a better control for circus prolific spots. So future work regarding this, the further analysis of this CR, the CR plus variety will be needed at high disease pressure and evaluations of genetic variability between those susceptible varieties, see crystal 572 and CR plus variety, which is still got infections, we will conduct the variability among them. And finally, I'll be working on the multispectral analysis of a multispectral analysis for uh, early detections of these sarcospora and alternaria in the sugar bit field using uh, UAV techniques. So if you have any questions, then I'd be happy to answer. Thanks. Our next presentation is early detection of latent infection in commercial sugar beet fields and the impact of CR plus resistance on pathogen population. 
Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Nate Wyatt. I'm your local USDA research plant pathologist and sugar beet epidemiologist. And today I'm going to talk to you about two projects that we've been doing um, in large part in collaboration with Gary Secor's lab, Viviana, and Dr. Melvin Bolton. Um, the two projects are um, latent detection of CLS infection in commercial fields and uh, briefly, I'm going to touch base on some of the monitoring we've been doing of the Cercospora population and its response to being introduced to CR plus genetics um, on a broad scale in the Red River Valley for the first time in 2021. So keep in mind, I'm going to be talking about 2022 data up here and 2021 data here, because we now just have the 2022 isolates from this year to do this analysis and see if that's consistent. Um, so jumping right into latent infection, the reason we were interested in this study is because we're trying to get a really good understanding of this disease cycle timeline. Um, and primarily, we're trying to get an idea of when infection starts following planting, which this year occurred in, mostly in May, unless you had a boat, but you can pull your planter behind. Um, and then after the latent infection starts and we've established a trend line for that, we're interested in then what factors then happen in between latent infection and symptom development. So that's what we'll be working on moving forward into the future. A um, little bit of background on this process. So as Gary mentioned, we've been using molecular markers to detect um, Cercospora DNA in asymptomatic green, healthy looking sugar beet leaves. Um, and one of the nice parts about working with Dr. Bolton's lab is they've already developed um, these molecular probes for um, mutations that are specific to Cercospora's uh, resistance adaptation to QOI fungicides, DMI fungicides, and Topsy. Um, and these are really useful because they're incredibly specific to Cercospora. And in the case of um, the cytochrome B marker, the QOI, so this, the QOI resistance target is cytochrome B in Cercospora reticula, and this is really useful because it's a multi-copy gene, which just means that we can detect Cercospora at a much lower threshold because we're detecting two times as much DNA as for the other two markers. Um, how this process works is we get samples shipped to us and we punch holes through the leaves. Um, this last year, we did about 10 punches per leaf and then that goes into our processing where we dry the leaf and then extract DNA. And then that DNA goes into our molecular assay where we get fluorescence curves, where if they pass a certain threshold, we can say that that's positive for CLS. And if they never make that threshold, obviously they are negative for CLS. Now in 2021, a pilot study was done um, primarily by Joe Hastings and his team um, looking at uh, exactly the same thing. So CLS latent prevalence, um, kind of in the Moorhead district of crystal sugars growing region. Um, and one of the things that's important to note here is that they actually were able to sample early enough to capture what we would consider a zero time point. So no infection detected um, in these 31 fields that they were able to sample. Um, detection, as you would expect, rises as the season goes on, um, with first spots detected in at least one of the fields as early as the 6th of July. Um, and this, you know, this kind of curve immediately gets us thinking about what kind of weather events lead to this initial detection, because we know from Gary's data that we have spores in this year, specifically as early as May 3rd. So you have spores that have clearly been exposed to the sugar beet almost a month before we start detecting latent infection. Now in 2022, we decided to expand on this project uh, by sampling 280 commercial fields across the entire growing region. Um, we had agriculturalists from all three co-ops submit five leaves uh, per selected field for four to five weeks. Um, and because we had these marker sets available to us, we decided to run uh, each of these resistance markers to see if we could also profile the latent infection fields for resistance to DMIs, QOIs, and Topsin, so that theoretically in the future, if we can establish that this is consistent, we can make decisions on first fungicide applications based on the resistance profile present in that field. Now, in 2022, we actually see um, essentially data mirroring what was observed in 2021. Um, right away, we started sampling uh, at the four to or three to four leaf stage. 
um, which typically occurred around uh, the middle of, Ju of June this year, uh, rising prevalence until approximately 100% prevalence by uh, the fourth week of our testing, which would be the 7th of July. Um, and CLS symptoms were uh, visually detected on some of the submitted leaves by that point as well, which if you remember from just two slides ago, first spots were detected in 2021 in select fields on 7-6. So approximately the same. And one of the interesting things about that uh, and also useful things about that is that you have very different weather patterns leading up to this. And that allows me then to go in and look at the different weather data that correlate with this latent infection kicking off and really start to cross out things that are clearly different between these two years. Now, before, so because we ran multiple fungicide resistance markers, we were able to get an idea of how fungicide resistance or, or spores that are initiating latent infection in these fields, um, what their resistance profiles look like. And one of the main things we see is that initially res QOI resistant isolates were dominant on these latent infections, but that was usually during um, what we would call low prevalence latent infection. So when samples were, of the 280 samples we were getting in the lab, they were around uh, 20 to 30 percent of those were positive for CLS infection. Now that the resistant to sensitive frequency here equilibrates as we move on into the season. And so really by the time the season kicked off, we had about a 50-50 ratio of those um, resistant to sensitive isolates detected. Now for Topsin, it was a very different event, you had sensitive isolates being dominant in the early season. And then as prevalence rose, so did the resist detection of resistant isolates in those fields. Um, and now I'm going to show you some DMI results. But before we do, I have to touch base on the different mutations that can lead to DMI resistance. So this work was done in Dr. Bolton's lab. Um, they I did, used the genome-wide association study um, in a large Cercospora reticula population to identify the mutation E170 and L144F, um, both of which when this mutation from a G to an A in the DNA of Cercospora happens, you get an increase in resistance to tetraconazole. Um, same thing happens here with the mutation from this G to this C, where you get this big jump in resistance with just with either of these two mutations. So one of the things we wanted to do um, is validate the utility of these two markers for determining resistance to the DMI fungicides. And so in order to do that, we paired up with Dr. Gary Secor and Viviana, and I'll spare you all of the uh, materials and methods behind this, but essentially in a very large, almost 600 isolate population in, from the Red River Valley, Viv very painstakingly went through and phenotyped um, on uh, serially diluted fungicide plates, um, resistance profiles for eminent, proline, inspire, and provisol. And then they handed that data off to me, and I was able to go through and cross correlate our marker data with whether or not it's predicting resistance. Um, and a couple things to point out here in that population cross resistance from proline and eminent, which were essentially the same in this year, uh, to inspire and provisol, which were essentially the same this year. Um, was as high as 98%, and the inverse is not true, where we actually see that Inspire and Provisol resistance is only cross-resistant to proline and eminent 67% of the time. So what this is telling us is that the two mutations may have a different effect on resistance to different DMI fungicides. And that's actually what we see in this data. Uh, we developed a little flow chart using E170 um, and the mutation you identify and L144F and the two different combinations of mutations you can identify. And the important part of this is that if we use the marker for DMI resistance from E170 and the marker for sensitivity from L144F, and you go down this chart, we are able to uh, accurately predict resistance to each of these four DMI fungicides at 96% accuracy and 96.3% accuracy. So this one up here, 96% accuracy being for tetraconazole and protheoconazole, uh, which would be eminent and proline. And then 96.3 would refer to diphenoconazole and mefentrofluconazole. And that would be Inspire and Provisol. 
So uh, if you are interested in how we verified the accuracy of these markers, come and find me. I can run you through all that data later. Um, but essentially what we see in 2022 is that resistance to proline and eminent rose as prevalence of latent infection rose in the fields. And the exact opposite was true of uh, Inspire and Provisol. And we were able to take a look back at some of the fungicide application data from the previous year. And oftentimes what we found was that Inspire and Provisol were some of the first DMIs applied, and which were then followed by either a tin, a topsin, or another fungicide chemistry. Um, and in regions where DMI was sprayed twice, we would see proline sprayed last which is, I think, why you see proline resistance at the beginning of the year starting off high and inspire resistance uh, essentially having the opposite trend where you're mostly detecting sensitive isolates. So a couple of takeaways from this CLS latent study um, results in pretty much mirror what we see in 2021, which is promising because as we move into doing this study in 2023, this is gonna give us a really good foundation um, for modeling the uh, environmental effects that are leading to uh, the development of uh, CLS latent infection. Um, in both years, by the first week of July, um, sorry, so in the first week of July, we have first spots detected, but um, in 2022, we had approximately 100% prevalence in CLS, of CLS latent infection in all fields tested. Um, in our earliest isolates, uh, are usually detected for QOI resistance, Thompson sensitivity, Inspire and Provisol sensitivity, uh, eminent and proline resistance. And this has a trend where it correlates very well with previous year's fungicide usage. So one of the things we're really interested in moving forward is diagnosing whether or not any of these things, so any of these fungicide resistance profiles that we see in the when we compare between years have any effect on fitness, um, but that well, for those studies are still ongoing. Um, last but not least, I wanted to touch base very quickly on some of the work we're doing on CR Plus, um, specifically on how Cercospora baticula is adapting and trying to warp around this resistance because the pathogen will always try to evolve around anything you throw at it. Um, and what we've seen by or through our whole genome sequencing of 100 isolates from both CR Plus and non CR Plus material, so it's 100 and 100, so 200 total isolates. What we see is that the isolates coming off of CR plus material are a reduced diversity subset of what we find in the non CR plus population. So there's no, at this point, there's no specific mutations that we've observed that are, that we would say are now CR plus virulent. However, it's this first stage of evolution where the weed out cycle happens and this bottleneck has occurred where only certain isolates are able to make that jump onto CR plus genetics. And you could think about it a little bit like if uh, you go to an amusement park and there's a ride that says you must be this tall to ride, that's what's happening to our isolates moving on to CR plus diversity. And so what we would anticipate moving forward is that these isolates that can infect will begin the process of adaptive evolution and trying to optimize their virulence on CR plus moving forward, which is why we'll continue to monitor this moving into 2023. And we've got 2022 data coming to match this 2021 data set. With that, I, got a, I have a few quick thank yous to make. First off, the Sugar Beet Research and Education Board for funding these projects. Um, Dr. Melvin Bolton's lab, uh, and specifically John Neubauer, who helped me get set up with the DNA extraction machine, the qPCR assays, and did a lot of teaching involved, or taught me a lot of things during that section. Um, also, Dr. Gary Secor's lab, um, and specifically Viviana, because Viviana has done an immense amount of work with fungicide resistances and they were able to hand me a ton of data, which is a joy for me. Um, and then Joe Hastings, Mike Metzger, Emma Burt, Mark Bloomquist, and all of the agricultural staff from uh, those three co from Crystal Sugar, Mendak, and Southern Men, because without them and their, their ability to collect and send me leaf samples for this study, it would have never happened. Um, with that, I'll take any questions you might have. Our uh, final presentation is Got a lot of notes here. Lessons learned in managing Cercospora particula in sugar beet, uh, presented by Dr. Mohammed Khan. Good afternoon and thank you. Thank you for waiting to this late hour. Uh, all of you were informed that I've been around for 
uh, 24 plus years. So I will share with you in the next 20 minutes or so, uh, some of the lessons learned. And as I told you earlier, I'm a slow learner. Some people say I never learn. So I'll share my little story, more or less using uh, pictures. I'm not very good at reading. So I'll tell you some stories about some basic research because when I started working with Lee Spot, say for you to manage your enemy, you must study and know him or her. So we studied the basic biology. I'll tell you some stories about that. Uh, Gary, I'm getting like you can barely see the computer. You want to bring it up a little bit closer to Mark? I will discuss a little bit about site-specific fungicides. I'll touch, I'll touch a little bit on resistance, when it happened, how it happened, the use of multi-site fungicides so that our industry could be saved, and CR plus varieties, which you heard a lot about, and then an overall uh, management strategy so that we can keep these CR plus varieties for a long, long time. So Cosmos started way back in 1876 in Italy. In a few years, because we were importing seeds from Italy, we brought the, sarcos the seeds as well as the fungus. Was it on the seeds? Was it on the debris? We're not sure, probably seed born. Uh, there's lots of work to show that. We weren't too sure how long the fungus survived in the soil. So I did some work. Imagine a short brown guy with a lot of lady pantyhoses having brown leaves smelling like, you know what, putting in these hoses, burying them, and then coming back either one year, two years, or three years afterwards, and checking to see if these spores will survive. We had them on the ground at four inch and eight inch depth. And what we found was that those that were not buried, that were on the ground, could survive for over two years and cause infection. If you bury them, they decompose, and after one year, they are gone. So anything you can do to decompose the the uh, debris, which has a pseudostromata, will reduce your fungal population. We weren't too sure about spore trapping, so we decided, first of all, to be innovative. And uh, those were that was a long time ago. Um, fluid intelligence was working then, so we used coffee cans, different sizes, different heights, different directions. Uh, we used Elvis Presley. Um, his Vaseline from his hair with some slides, and we were able to collect Sarcospora, so much so that we then moved on to pressure cooker. Uh, we had a lot of pressure cookers converted into uh, spore traps, and then we also had spore traps. We found that you can collect spores, and at one time in the early 2000s, I will private, provide information to Alan Katana, Tyler, and others in June, and when we found the spores in the field, They'll say the tradition was, if it were, were warm and wet, about two weeks afterwards, you'll see leaf spots in the field. If it was dry, it would probably take about three weeks. Uh, I worked with Dr. Larry Smith at the University of Minnesota, Crookston. He had some research site with Sarcospora, and this was where we kind of found it was easy to uh, collect the samples using different spore trapping methods. The cans was, of course, a system whereby the wind will just blow the spores in. The Borkar spore traps was actively pulling in spores. They had more spores in those spore traps. We also wanted to find out where this, these spores were coming from. We were recommending to producers, and all of them were doing this here, having three years rotation, some of them a little bit longer. So if you had rotation, did you have spores in those fields that you had uh, beats maybe four years ago, or were they coming in from the previous year or previous years, two years of inoculum? And this little trial that we did here, where we had bare soil, or the soil was covered with plastic, and then we use a cage, put it over the bare soil or over the plastic, we found that once we had a plastic cage, you had very little to no disease, which meant that the spores that you were getting in a particular year once you followed crop rotation system, were coming from previous year, the previous year's more or less inoculum. That's what this graph is kind of telling us here. And this is published in Plant Disease, if anybody needs to look at that. Now, once upon a time, we used to do surveys with all our producers, and it told us a story as to how many applications of fungicides grower use, and they were also honest enough to tell us if these fungicides were working or not. 
Way back in the 80s, in 87, we hardly used much fungicide. In 1995, we used more fungicides because we had a small epidemic then. And in 1998, when we were using mainly tin and a little bit of mancozeb, we had an epidemic because the tin was not working. We saw from Dr. Secor's data that over 65% of the, of the sarcospora isolate collected were resistant to tin. So our growers lost over $100 million because of the disease. The growers in the southern area where it's warmer, wetter, and they start planting earlier, had many more applications compared to growers at American Crystal and Mindac, and they probably lost the most money as well. As a matter of fact, after their hands were burned so much, they continue to apply fungicides year after year, three or four times, sometimes when it were not needed, just because of the fact that the disease was so severe. You can see based on this uh, graph here, that after 1998, by around 2003, 2004, growers were using at one time just about two applications per year. And this is growers in North Dakota, Minnesota. Most of that was used in the southern areas. In the northern area, they were probably using just one application. And I'll tell you the story about that. Uh, why from 1999 to about 2015, it were uh, more or less glorious years because Sarcospora was well managed. This is the year of the Lord 1999. The previous year, we lost $100 million. We did not need to inoculate. This is the plot. You came on July 4th. You already had symptoms. You got the rows were closed. The varieties that we had were very susceptible. Tin applied four times. This was what was being used the year before. They were not uh, effective because of resistance issue. What saved us was the fact that we had eminent. We used eminent, tin eminent in a rotation program from 1999 to 2002. And that's what saved our industry. From 2003, we had the product called Headline which was one of the best products that we have ever used for managing cost for lease spot. But we have to be careful, and I want you to remember this. Headline was one of our best products. I'll show you some data that by 2016, it was no longer effective. Today, CR Plus Varieties is one of our best tools. Let us not let our CR Plus variety go the way that Headline has gone. So we use eminent, Headline and, and eminent again, from around 2002 to 2005, our growers use rotation, one product at a time, at about 14 days interval, starting around the middle of June, of July. Excellent control. At the same time, when we were doing this here, we saw that tin, which you just saw just now, was not working in 1999, because of the fact that we were using two other chemistries, these DMIs, and QOIs wiped out those resistant isolates so much so that by 2005, using tin alone was just as good as any one of the site-specific fungicides. So what did we start to do? After 2005, our growers now had, once again, an additional chemistry, in addition to the DMI and the QOIs, the tin, which was just as effective in their arsenal. So for a number of years, from 1999 to 2015, you can see when we use fungicides in a rotation program, three or four applications, be it in the south or in the north, you had excellent disease control, high recoverable sucrose, and we were in the business of making money. In the year of the Lord 2016, it was the warmest and wettest of 122 years of record keeping in Minnesota. It was good for sugar beet production. They grew, they loved the heat, they loved the water, but so did the fungus. And one of the things about Sarcospora, it multiplies and it multiplies rapidly. In one season, you can have five or six generations and each acre you have over a trillion spores. So you have large numbers. If you control 90 or 95%, you can still have serious infection. So this is what happened in, 19, in 2016. So uh, a lot of these pictures here, the one to your left, to your right, was taken at Fox Home, where the growers were using headline as the third application. Most of our growers at that particular time 
headline was the mantra, use it around the 25th of August. You'll have good leaf spot control. You'll have high recoverable sucrose. If you're in the northern part of the valley, you'll have frost protection. Those fields start to look brown. Our grow, this was our grower field. He applied two more fungicides and nothing helped. And that continued. And the reason was, as explained earlier, we have QOI resistance. It was full blown. But not only was there QOI resistance, please take a note of this picture here. This was taken on our plot tour on the 29th of August. The 29th of August, this is a check, top left. I'll show you a picture that we had in 2022 of the entire site. Piaxor, which is part, which has headline inside it, as I said, was one of our best fungicide. By 2016, you had resistance. The rating was similar to the check. Your triazoles, which were as, just as good as your headline, also started to become ineffective, so much so that some of them were not uh, very much different from the check. You can see the QOIs, it didn't matter if you were using headline or gem or pyroclostrobin, which had become generic. They were not working because of resistance issues. The triazoles, it didn't matter which one of them we had, they were not working. We tried uh, biologicals, they too were not effective. What saved us was tin, a multi-site fungicide that was working from 2016 and it is still working today. And I'll show you some pictures with that. What we also saw, we couldn't just use tin alone. We had to use some of the triazoles and the one that has consistently been most effective has been proline. We've seen that if you had triazole or an EBDC or a copper, multi-site fungicides to the triazoles, you have better disease control. You'll see some pictures whereby once you mix a tin by itself with anything else, it will be good. The numbers tell you the same thing. And this is also very relevant for the growers in the north and now our growers throughout the valley, based on the fact that last year, we didn't have much disease throughout the production area, even in Southern Minnesota, where you have the most severe disease. There are certain multi-site fungicides, such as manzate, the coppers, and the tin that are able to give you excellent disease protection without using a QOI or a DMI. Uh, Mancosavage is a mixture of a copper and a EBDC. If you add a copper and an Inspire, it works well. And the story goes on the same for an EBDC and Proline. So for a number of years, our growers if you apply fungicides in mixtures after 2016 in a rotation program, and in nearly every one of those applications, you had a multi-site fungicide, especially EBDC or a copper, you had excellent control. We also saw, especially at the uh, Fox home site, without using a DMI or a QOI, without using a DMI or a QOI, you had excellent disease control. Here again, this is another message that we may be able to use this in a low disease year or low disease years. So when, it, when it's dry and you can apply your fungicides without getting washed off, you're in good business. What happens when it's wet? In the year of the Lord 2020, we could spray over and over again. Every time you sprayed, a day or two afterward, you'll have two inches or three inches of rainfall. When this disease rating was done, the CLS rating for the check was 10. We did five or six, sometimes seven application. When the checks had 10, the ones with fungicide had about 5.5. But by the time of harvest, you couldn't tell the difference between the checks and those that were sprayed. And don't blame the fungicides. It's just that when you apply the fungicides, the rain will come, it'll wash it off. So all you have is the inherent resistance of the host to withstand the disease. And none of our varieties were capable of doing that, as this picture clearly tells. This was the Fox home site. Anything that you see there that looks a little bit green, those were CR plus varieties. Everything else that we had, all the other uh, co commercial varieties were all brown, no matter how many applications we made. 
I told you earlier, I want you to remember the date, August 29th, this is August 26th. This is a site with susceptible and CR plus varieties. We inoculated this as well. And still, as Sunil told you earlier, with the CR plus varieties, we could not find spots. We could not find spots, even one spot, until the 20th of August. We had our plot tour on the 30th of August, a number of you were there. And one of the things I've learned from my early days in plant disease was, you have to get a susceptible host, a virulent or a very infectious pathogen, and the environment must be favorable long enough for us to get infection. That has not changed over time. And no matter how much inoculum I put, a picture to the top and the bottom shows that all varieties, including CR plus varieties that I have up there, at cotyledonary stage, throughout their life, four leaf, six leaf, this one was at eight, six leaf stage, they are all susceptible to Sarcospora beticula in greenhouse condition. In greenhouse condition, if you make it warm, if you make it humid, and you put it all three things together, you have disease. At the same time, these varieties were in the field, they were inoculated, and we didn't get any infection until July, uh, August the 20th. Way back in 2002, when we were trying to improve a model, I did work in Fox Home, I did work in St. Thomas. And what it kind of told us then, based on daily infection values, and when we apply fungicide was, if you apply fungicides, if you were to apply fungicides, starting when you or your neighbor see the first symptoms or a district, and you continue to apply fungicides at least 14 days afterwards, based on the presence of symptoms and DIV values, you will have excellent disease control if you don't have too much rainfall. That held true then, it will still hold true now, the one thing that we have to take into consideration is that time is money. You need to go out into the field and to scout to make sure you can apply at appropriate time and then do it in a timely manner. So what we have seen in the fields for a number of years now is that in our trials, we inoculate it. And you can talk to my other colleagues who inoculate. You can inoculate one, three, five, or 10 times. As Dr. Katana when he was inoculating way back in the 80s in Fargo, he will go out in the morning, he will go out in the night, and he can spray and he can inoculate. If that weather is dry, you don't get any disease. So what we were seeing at Foxhome for the past several years, a lot of times, especially if it's dry, the disease does not come up until very late in the season. And in my 24 years of working with fungicides, it was only around 2005 and 2022 that the disease came up so late. And in some trials, in some trials, the non-treated check was not significantly different in yield or recoverable sucrose than those that you sprayed several times, just because the fungus was not infecting. So yes, you can get infection. It usually happens late in the season. In this particular case here, the picture on the top left was taken on September 8th. As we spoke earlier, we do have CL, CR plus varieties. They are not immune. I showed you pictures from cotyledonary stage throughout their lifespan. They are susceptible if you have the right environment and the right load of inoculum. In the field, it seems that they take a much longer time than susceptible varieties, but we have to be careful and make sure that the fungicides we use are effective at controlling them. The, one of the sad thing about this new tool is that it's so good, it's so good that sometimes you apply fungicides and you're having excellent control and you're thinking it's the fungicide. No, it might just be from the natural host resistance. And if you're using fungicides that are not effective, that are not effective at controlling the pathogen, after a time, we can lose this new technology. Now, 
We have low inoculum right now. We have CR plus varieties. Some of our fungicides are not working. Is there anything new on the horizon? Yes, we have QOIs, the quinone outside in, uh, inhibitors, that's the strobilurins, but they are gone. There is a new chemistry called a QII, quinone inside inhibitor. Several years ago, I went with Gary Secor to Germany to see to get BASF to give us this product which was first announced. Unfortunately, they couldn't give us. Right now, Corteva is working with this product here and hopefully ran 2025. 2025, I hope we can push them to do it a little bit earlier. This chemistry is different from QOI and it can control isolates that are resistant to QOIs. I will expect it to also control isolates that are uh, resistant to the other modes of action. This can be a game changer for the sugar beet industry to help preserve our CR plus varieties. So I expect based on previous experiences when we've had uh, an epidemic, after a few years of that epidemic, the population seems to die down. It's like COVID. You have a spike of the population, then it kind of comes down and we're okay. Right now, it seems like with Sarcospor least spot, our disease pressure will be down. Our fields will be green, but the good Lord does not like a vacuum. So we have to be careful. We still have to look at our fields. There are certain other diseases that are willing to take its place. Dr. Ashok Chandler told you a little earlier about Altonaria. There is Altonaria. There's one called white mole that can be there when it's, warm, when it's cool and wet, especially if you had lots of soybean with disease there. There's one called Stemphilion uh, that looks like Sarcospora and is as damaging as Sarcospora with the uh, white mole. It can cause infection to the leaves as well as the root, which is kind of dangerous. So keep on the lookout. You are the ones, the producers, especially our agriculturists who are out there all the time seeing what's happening. Bring it back to your researchers and I'm sure they'll be able to find solutions. So as my take home message is, our enemy is Sarcospora. It has very large numbers, it's very prolific, and it has been known to develop resistance to nearly any different type of fungicide you have, especially the more modern site-specific fungicides. Even with good CR plus varieties in the future, we shall always, always take a lesson from the Greeks and use a product such as they use chlorotanil, we should always use probably an EBDC with any other chemistry to protect our CR plus varieties or any other new varieties we get. And I will highly recommend to KWS that you start looking for another uh, resistant gene to use because it will only be a matter of time before we get resistant to the CR plus varieties. Use a holistic system using crop rotation, incorporating your debris. Anything you can do to use your fungicides in a timely manner, use your time to scout, use it only when necessary. And the reason why I tell you this is I have two young daughters as pretty as their mother, they didn't resemble me. And I, I've told them since they were kids, I don't want you to become addicted to anything, cigarette or rum that your dad is drinking. And if you don't want to become addicted, don't ever start using any of those stuff. Anytime we use any pesticide, herbicide, insecticide, fungicide, anytime we start killing anything, there is a something called selection pressure. And once, the more you use something, the more you use it, the higher that selection pressure. So sometimes you say, it's good to say, yes, let's use more fungicides to control a disease, but you use it judiciously, because if not over time, we can lose them. And as you have seen over time, it takes a long, long time to get a new effective uh, mode of action. With that, I'd like to say thank you for your many years of support, for the r &E Board for providing funding, all the allied industry for providing seeds and um, other inputs that we need. Luke for taking out the picture to show what happened on uh, August the 26th. Kevin for allowing me to contaminate his field, all my colleagues for harvesting, 
and Peter for doing all the hard work with our interns. Thank you.